Is it fair to say that Mina is also a decentralized distributed computer? I call it that all the time. Um, yeah, welcome. I'm, I'm basically, today I'm going to give a talk about um, how Mina works. So I'm going to start from the ground up. I'm going to talk about, you know, what a blockchain is, you know, why, what it looks like to apply zero knowledge proofs to a blockchain. Um, and then talk about the properties you get at that, talk about a consensus sum, and then finally at the very end, I'll, I'll wrap it all up by talking about ZK apps in depth. Um, so it's meant to be very interactive. Please ask questions as we go. Um, like I said, I might miss things, so um, just stop me, you know, raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you. I'm gonna do a very short little presentation on where Mina sits in the world of systems. Like, you know, why is Mina unique? And I think this is a pretty good way to think about why Mina is so unique. It also helps explain some of the unique challenges you have to deal with at a very high level as like a developer for Mina ZK apps. Um, so if you think about systems, you can kind of divide systems up into these categories where one access is replicated versus distributed. Another uh, access is permission versus permissionless. So if we take some examples, like looking at each of these grids, What's an example of like a permissioned replicated system? Well, in the database world, a really simple example is like MySQL. You know, the way that MySQL works, if you have a cluster of MySQL servers is, well, if I only have one MySQL server, it's not really a, a distributed system at all in terms of like where, how, how you're structuring, you just have one server, but to scale it, you know, we need to have many servers. And the way you usually do that is you're just like copying the data onto every single server. So that every single server can serve a query and then you're round robining which server you're sort of asking for information in MySQL. And so in that sense, like MySQL is a replicated permission system. It's permissioned, you know, it's not like people are going to come in and run their own database on top of yours and not going to join your network. You're running all the SQL servers and you're replicating all the data through it, through a, a very antiquated terminology of master-slave replication. That's what they call it, where there's one server that receives all the rights and then it tells all the other servers about what was written there and then they replicate the data locally. Another example, this is, requires a little bit of, you know, thinking, it's not very obvious, but I would also say in this category is like a web page, right? Web pages, you can permission them, you can permission them behind access, you know, you have to authenticate and you control that, maybe it is permissionless, but typically it is permission. And it's also replicated. Every single time you go to a web page, you're downloading JavaScript code and executing that JavaScript code locally to reproduce the web page in the environment, right? And so it's replicated across a whole bunch of computers and it's permission. And we move down to the distributed and permissioned model. We have things like Bigtable, or if you've heard of Cassandra. These are other types of databases. So it's literally on its last leg. Um, and so these kind of databases, they work differently from MySQL in the sense that they're not replicating all the data around to all the different servers. They're distributing the data between all the different servers. Every server has different pieces of the data. And when you send a query to the network, the network first figures out which servers do you have to talk to to get this data, and then goes and talks to all those servers to get the data and collects it back. So if MySQL had like, you know, 10 terabytes of data, every single server running in the MySQL cluster has to have 10 terabytes of hard drive storage. In Bigtable or Cassandra, these databases, you actually have every single server just has to have you know, maybe 100 gigabytes or a couple hundred gigabytes of storage. And that 10 terabytes of data is split across all those systems. So it's distributed. Another example of distributed permission system would actually be a web server. So like a web server, by comparison to a web page, when you go and you hit a web server, you're hitting the load balancer and the load balancer is going to send you to one of the servers that's going to actually run the computation once to give you the response. Not every single web server is actually repeating the computation, so it's not replicating that computation. It's just distributing the computation to different servers in the network. If we go over to permissionless and replicated systems, well, this is basically Ethereum and every other like world computer blockchain that's like EEM based or anything like that. Because it's permissionless, anybody can come and join and participate in the network, right? It's open. Anybody can run an Ethereum node, but it's replicated because every time you are running an execution inside the EVM, every single computer on the network is executing, right? You're literally replicating the computation because that replication of computation is how you array trust. It, the fact that you redo the computation means I don't trust anybody else who did the computation. If we come down to this grid here, 
uh, permissionless and distributed. This is where Mina lives. And to my knowledge, nobody has been able to point out one that fits here except for Mina so far. Mina is the only system that is both distributed and permissionless. Anybody can come and they can join Mina. We do replicate proofs initially, but we throw out those proofs very quickly. All we're doing is replicating the verification of those proofs for a short period of time before they get merged back together. All the computation that happens on Mina is happening off-chain in a distributed fashion. Only one computer needs to do that, and then it's just submitting the verifiable proof of that computation to the Mina network. And so it's really the only thing that fits here in this category of distributed permissions. There are some things that kind of move towards this direction a little bit, but nothing that goes fully into this category. And in general, um, it's kind of interesting because normally when you think about this axis right here, what you're getting with this axis is basically scaling. But traditional systems like an Ethereum that are doing scaling through L2s and stuff are also pushing along this axis. In order to scale Ethereum and L2, you have to centralize and become more permissioned over time. Even sharding in Ethereum is basically splitting things up into smaller and smaller buckets of permission centralized systems. And so Mina is the only one that's really moving along this direction of the axis. Without sacrificing permission nature or decentralization, we still maintain all the decentralization and permissionless behavior. And we have complete uh, distribution of not only the computation, but also the data. Because you can use private inputs to your start to basically not have to share the data with the network, you have no reason to replicate data on the network. You can actually keep data completely off the network in a distributed fashion. And this is where a lot of the unique use cases for me to come. It's all from the concept that you can have distributed data and distributed computation. That's what makes Mila unique. Any, any questions on that? Where is Celestia? Where, where is Celestia? It's, it's replicated. All the data is replicated in Celestia. So it's permissionless replicated. I would say IPFS is also permissionless replicated. They have some degree of distribution, but they require replication. Um, yeah, throw out anything else. Anybody have other ones? Any MPC networks? Who? Any MPC networks? Yeah, I mean, a lot of multi-party communicate, like computation networks are being done on top of permissionless replicated systems. So they're replicating the verification and the bits of information that are being spread along. Mm. I don't know a lot of MPC networks that are truly like peer-to-peer. They always require some sort of layer for global state synchronization, and that's where Ethereum comes in. Mina is a global state synchronization layer that, you know, is in that category. So, yeah, NPC by itself, offline, you could completely do, but the need for some kind of global layer to aggregate information back to and synchronize is what kind of pushes to these systems. Um, I recently learned about one that's kind of straddling this foundry a little bit. What was the name of it? I, I can find it really quick. No, Alio is replicated. Alio does not merge everything back into a recursive proof. So they do distribute some offline computation, but they have to constantly replicate all the verification of that forever. They don't merge things back and together the proofs. They have to always replicate every single proof that was ever submitted to the chain and serve it forever. And if you want to join the chain and check the chain state, you have to go through and verify every single O of N proofs. So they are distributing the computation in some sense. So they're kind of on this border but they're replicating all the verification and the data required to sequence it together. I was recently, somebody shared with me what I was looking at. Uh, oh yeah, Oasis is a little bit on this boundary where Oasis is actually a permissionless replicated system in the sense that um, they're in this category because they're running EBM, but the EBM has like a bunch of pre-compiles for some set of, you know, cryptographic primitives that allow for privacy. So they sort of have some distribution aspect, but if you actually dive into how their EBM works, all the computation has to be replicated. It's just hidden behind some cryptography that hides the information. So they're kind of like, I would say they're here, like getting close to it. Alia, I would say is like maybe here, just barely touching, dipping their feet into the other side. Why do you think there hasn't been many um, distributed permissionless blockchains like Mina? Yet this design actually isn't like scalable. So I think there's a few reasons. One, it's really hard to build. I mean, you can see how many years it took us to build. Um, 
The other thing is that people are really bought into the existing ecosystem. Everybody wants an EVM chain, and an EVM chain is inherently not going to work in that model. Um, and you know, you could try and retrofit it, which is what they're doing. But I always say it's kind of like moving, changing the engine on a moving car. Um, I think the other thing is that to a certain extent, Mina is the first one that's really proved this, and it really hasn't, you know, proved it fully. Like I believe it. People who are here might believe it, but Mina today, you know, is really slow right? It, that is on purpose. That's because we've entirely prioritized building the system out and worrying about scalability later. But the, the whole design of Mina, as I was going over, is designed from scalability from the ground up. It's just an engineering task that hasn't been done to scale it, pretty much. You know what I mean? And so in that sense, people look at Mina and they see the current properties of it and don't fully understand the design and don't see this as necessarily being scalable. I, I hear that a lot. Like People are like, oh, the TPS is so low. Oh, the you know, you have this account model, how, yeah, exactly, block time, how can you ever scale it? And the answer is we just purposefully have it. It's been a very explicit resource decision to not scale Mina yet, because all the design there is, is there to scale it. Like, we're sort of not worried about it, you know? None of the engineers are really that worried about scaling it. We don't see that as a problem, in a sense. Um, but in that sense, because we haven't done it yet, it's not really proven to the world. What, uh, what were the significant gaps um between mina and them that are interesting to know about to understand i mean the probably the easiest one to compare directly is uh alio uh, you know alio is also a blockchain which is um based on zero knowledge proofs and has a programmability layer for zero knowledge proofs um alio is a blockchain is like this completely private l1 so instead of doing the public l1 they're basically doing a fully private l1 that comes with a lot of problems with consensus perspective but the way they get around that is just by doing proof of work the big difference between how Alio and Mina works, at the end of the day, the important one to understand for the differentiation in this category, is that Alio receives proofs and transactions and puts them into a block and that's it, it's done. Everybody who wants to join the chain has to go through and verify every single proof that was ever submitted by any application. If I want to verify an application state, I can't just look up the statement for the application state. I actually need to download every single block that ever had a transaction with that in there and verify all of those transactions. And if those transactions involve interacting with other applications, I then do the same for all the other applications too. So it becomes this giant, you know, because they're not doing that part where they're, you know, that layers I was showing before, sort of like the tower and user proofs and the transaction proofs that merge together into blockchain proofs, they can't tell the same story as a whole about the distributed and permissionless system because you can't joist. You join it as if it's a permissionless distributed it's a replicated system. So you distribute the computation, but you don't get any of the benefits of it. I see. And how would you compare Mina to BitTorrent in this case? Like, because I, I imagine yeah. you end up in the lower right quadrant, but then... I think BitTorrent is... That's actually a good point. I think Torrent is down here more. Torrent does replicate things for redundancy. And so it's a little bit in the boundary here i guess like ipfs is also a little bit there because they replicate things for redundancy but they don't fully replicate it all the time you do the proof of storage thing in order to prove that you have the storage you're supposed to have locally but you don't store the entire database it's not quite mysql but it's not quite cassandra right and so BitTorrent is kind of here like it's permissionless anybody can come provide data that data can be checked by the network it is distributed but also the i guess this is why i would say the data in BitTorrent is replicated the packets are distributed in a sense. You know what I mean? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Because if, if I'm if I'm seeding a file on BitTorrent, I have the whole file, right? If I'm going to be a seeder, I download the entire file yeah. all the time. BitTorrent can never be used for private information. It's interesting because the this comparison and the comparison before with, uh, or the strategy to, uh, to layer the Merkle tree um, in order to, to level out the proof work, the mm. load of proofs, um, uh, seems to come to being able to look at the problem from a different perspective and look at another way to cut it up. Yeah, that's why I was th interested to hear how you uh, how you distinguish BitTorrent so that it, so it's a packets. It's like it's straddling it because like network activity is distributed, yeah. but data is replicated. It's distributed network activity to replicate data. Right. So from micro level, from user level, from a user perspective is one thing, but then from a network perspective, it's another. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.
Um, so in terms of competition, it's I guess it's certain that Mina achieves everything that Ethereum can achieve uh, in theory. But in terms of storage, um, can Mina scale enough to actually be considered a storage layer? I mean, like, for instance, IPFS, can Mina even, you know, be used as IPFS is used? Because in that, we need live data. It never would be, I don't think. We, we can increase the storage and, like, have a system for bonding for storage, but we'll never have an IPFS-like data storage layer directly in Mina. So then, like, in that sense, does it make sense to actually compare Cassandra to Mina? Because one is a data layer and the other doesn't. I'm not really comparing Cassandra to Mina. It, it, I apologize if it looks like I am. I'm just trying to categorize where different things fit in systems. But I wouldn't compare Cassandra to Mina at all. Um, where you can kind of compare it, though, is don't think about Mina as blockchain. Mina is bigger than the blockchain. Mina is a distributed permissionless computer. Anybody who's running a night a light client and joins the network and is doing computation is participating in that computer. And in that sense, you can build Cassandra on top of Mina. In other words, you can have distributed data that's even private and accessed across different servers that connect to Mina and provide that data. The blockchain itself will never have the storage. Computers can come and join the network with the storage and provide it. In other words, IPFS kind of things can be layered on top of Mina, but not the Mina blockchain itself, not the L1, right? Um, then can you describe... Um like a perfect uh, data storage layer that would fit into Mina? Like how a perfect data layer should look into Mina? I don't know. I mean, how a perfect one should look, that's hard because perfect is not possible with data storage layers usually. You always have to make some kind of concession. Maybe one day we'll figure it out, but I would say I can get some examples for how data storage layers could work that's unique to Mina. Like um, one thing I've thrown around uh, a little bit recently is this idea of sort of like a ZK SQL. You can have a shared schema that's committed to on Mina. And different computers can come and submit proofs about the data that's being inserted into their local copy of that data. That's their local distributed data set. They're not sharing that data set with other people. And then you, as a user, can basically have the, the schema can have a permission model around what can be accessed and what needs to be anonymized or aggregated together for certain kinds of queries, like permission layers that you can prove for access. And then you can submit queries to Mina. And Mina runs a distributed join operation that allows these computers to come in and are incentivized to come participate with their data and come provide it. So as an example, you can imagine like Facebook and Google and different companies like this, they have all this user data. This would be an evil way of using it, but it's also a real way. Um, they can come in, instead of like selling their data to data brokers and then data brokers reselling it to third parties, they could keep their data and they could actually just allow people to come query their data, but not just query their data, query the whole set of user data across all these services. So advertisers could get like anonymized information about users using the ZK SQL thing, and all of these big companies are coming and actually attaching their data to the network and then helping assist in the distributed join operation that's facilitated by Mina. So that's like the distributed, that's an example of the distributed data aspect, right? Different parties have different data. They can provide proofs around that data. People can provide proofs around accessing that data. It can be aggregated, anonymized, however you want to set it up, but it just becomes one schema interface into all the data by different companies. Is having a virtual machine a factor in um, dif um, in, in dividing replication and distribution? So, yes and no. The answer is like, so you can imagine that you take a ZKBM and you plug it in the Mina. It's one of the things that's in discussion. I'm like not totally sold on it yet. But it's something people bring up sometimes because we do have O1VM now, which is a framework for building ZK VMs. And so you could plug that into Mina and have some form of on-chain execution. It's initially replicated. So uh, it's not even really initially replicated. It's a little tricky. You don't, you'd have to design it very carefully. That's the issue with like the ZK VM kind of route. You need to replicate until the proof is produced because you have this asynchronous proving thing. You have to replicate the execution of that virtual machine outside of the zero knowledge proof. And then once it's proved by a single person, you never have to replicate it again. So you have like short spans of replication. And in a sense, that's even true on Mina today. Like it, you replicate the actual transaction application as a block producer initially, but then you very quickly stop replicating it. It's like replicated once across the, the, the servers and then no other server ever has to redo it again because it gets proven. So like there is always sort of some level of back and forth here, but but what you're really getting with Mina and the real power of it is the fact that you're have a very limited scope of temporal, very temporary replication that happens, which is just the gossip network essentially. The gossip network is the very temporary replication layer. But all of the compute that happens off chain, anything that's happening inside of a ZK app is never replicated on chain. 
And that's the thing. So if you put a ZKVM here, you would have short-term replication, and then you would have to run that, and then you would be able to throw it out, which still has a lot of the benefits. But as long as you're working with the ZK app world off-chain and not using a ZKVM, you're getting a full distribution, no replication ever. And, and, and this is a silly question, but um, the reason why my, my, the reason why um, Ethereum is called decentralized computer was I thought, well, I thought it was because of the virtual machine. But um, since Mina doesn't have virtual machine, are we allowed to, um, is, it, is it fair to say that Mina is also a decentralized um, distributed computer? I call it that all the time. <laughs> I, I think it is because this is the way I think about it. It's like, uh, it's a, it's a decentralized distributed computer that any device can join. Your phone can join, do a computation, and leave. And that is still participating in the distributed computer. It's still rolled up into the same computer. It's part of the same global computation that the MENA blockchain is doing, right? And so it is a distributed computer in a different way than like Ethereum is. So um, to start out, we'll just do a really quick intro. I'm sure everybody knows this here, but I think it's useful because sometimes people don't always think about this too much and it's useful for you know anybody who might be watching the video as well of like what is a zero knowledge proof not like what is the cryptography of it but just abstractly what a zero knowledge proof is and essentially the way you can think about a zero knowledge proof is the way you write it well should I do the witness thing I won't do that for now abstractly you have some set of constraints that you can write down And then from that set of constraints, you can derive a proving key and a verification key. Okay, these are two cryptographic values that you basically derive directly from the constraints that you write down. And by writing down these constraints, you can essentially um, prove anything, right? These constraints are just saying, hey, given some input values, here's a whole bunch of constraints that have to hold on those input values. And so from that, you get this proving key and this verification key. And the way you can use these is you can basically do a proving operation where you're taking in the proving key, you're taking in some private input, and you're taking in some public input. And then from that, you can get out a proof. And this is just a few kilobytes of information. It's some cryptographic data. And then what you can do is you can take the verification key and the public input and the proving key, and then you can verify that proof. Okay, this is a cheap operation that you can do once you have the proof. You don't need any of the private inputs to do this. You don't need the proving key, which is this big blob of data. You only have to know the verification key and understand the constraints they were derived from, and then you can do this operation to verify it, and it can be done in tens of milliseconds. What a recursive zero knowledge proof is basically when you do this same system, but you're also taking the proof and treating it as an input. Actually, let's, let's do it this way because it's usually how you do it. This is what you want to do. You're basically taking the proof and you're putting it in as a private input to the next proof. Okay, that's the recursive part of recursive zero knowledge proofs. And so if you think about this now, the constraints that you write down that are reasoning about these inputs are just doing this whole process inside the constraints, right? If you take this whole thing, or rather this part of it, the verify step, and stuff it into the constraints, now you can do this operation where you can keep on feeding proofs back in over and over and over again, and that's how you're building up this recursive zero knowledge proof. At the end, you're still up to the same small proof, but now you've encapsulated the same constraints run through the program multiple times, right? So you have a static set of constraints, and then you keep on updating the inputs and like recursively proving more and more stuff every generation. Any questions about that before I move on? I think everybody knows this. You give a bit more context to what the constraints are? Sure. The constraints can really be anything, right? You can prove anything with constraints, any kind of proof that you write down. But what's interesting about this is like, that's a very abstract concept, right? It's like, well, what do you actually do with constraints? Um, because you can do anything with it, I think the most important thing to really understand of what you can do with constraint is the concept of verifiable computation. In other words, if I want to compute something, any value that I want to compute, right, I can take that computation and I can turn it into a constraint system 
which is going to provide constraints essentially on the execution trait, the execution trace of a program. Okay. And this is really the abstract way that I like to think about the constraint model. Because when you think about it as verifiable compute, it's like any computer program that you can run, you can encode as constraints. There is this sort of little asterisk here, which is that the you can do verifiable compute of finitive things. So in other words, you can't write a for loop that's like, you know, four zero to n, where n is just any value. It has to be like four zero to one hundred or four zero to one thousand. But because you have this recursive layer, right? You can basically still model any program using the system because even though each individual set of constraints has to be finitive, you can't like have it be infinite. You can keep on feeding it back in and basically use that to stage the various steps of your program computation. And so the real thing to think about constraints here, what you're really getting the power of this is this concept of verifiable compute that you can compute anything and then you can prove it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Uh, so they've been saying that proof aggregation and recursive proofs are not exactly the same thing. Uh, does it matter for Mina or what's the difference basically? I've been wondering. Proof aggregation versus recursive proofs. Well, proof aggregation is just when you collect a whole bunch of proofs together, right? Is that is that usually how people are using that term? That's how I've heard it used in different contexts. It's a little vague term, but is that what you mean? Um, yeah, but they say like... Um, they say recursion is not the only way of aggregating proofs. So I've been wondering, is there like other ways of actually adding proofs inside other proofs and maybe uh, improve the process? I don't know. So I think probably what people are referring to there, I'm not 100% sure because with the industry in general, people use these very big terms and use it in multiple contexts, is mostly folding. That's the very common scheme besides recursion. Folding is instead of doing this stuff, and I'll talk more about folding at the end, Instead of having this recursive step where the proof is fed back in to re-verify it, what you're doing is you're actually taking a whole bunch of executions of these public and private inputs, and you're using some cool math trick that I don't fully understand, but I could try and talk about sometime if you're interested, where you basically combine them all together into one set of inputs. So in other words, the constraints have to hold against a whole list of these inputs, right? But you can merge all those inputs together such that the constraints will still hold when you check the proof. Okay. And so it, it's the idea of like either recursively verifying some prior proof in this case, which is a very powerful primitive, but has some performance trade offs, versus having to take all the public and private inputs all in one batch and then merge them together. You'll notice one of the big trade offs with that is that once you make that batch, all the private inputs have to be known for that batch. In other words, you're losing the ability to sort of hand off part of the computation you've done to somebody else and then continue it, right? If I have some private input and somebody else has some private input, we can't aggregate those proofs together without recursion unless we're going to share those inputs with each other. One last one for the video. So the, the constraints is your ZK circuits is about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, I, I really don't like the word circuit and I will use it throughout this talk sometimes because it's become an industry standard. Um, and... People, once again, with a lot of terms in the industry will mean different things when they say circuits. But the traditional, the very first version of circuits was before we were talking about recursive stuff. Okay? And so a circuit was just basically, the way you think about it is it's like a directed acyclic graph of your constraints. That's basically what they mean when they say a circuit. It's this idea of taking an execution trace where different values in the execution trace are derived from other values. And so you can sort of build a big graph from it. Um, and the reason I hate circuit is because circuit literally you know, is, is cyclic by nature, whereas constraints are always acyclic. So that's why I hate the word circuit. Nowadays, some people are trying to use the word circuit only to refer to the concept of when you're using recursion because they've realized that you need a cyclic nature to actually make it make sense. But even that doesn't make sense because you can only take the output and then feed it back in as an input. You can't actually have the individual nodes of the graph of constraints talk about each other. Okay, so, um, but yes, constraints are circuit just with the caveat that it's not actually a circuit. So I know that the pros of having the recursion is um, having having it lightweight, but what are some constraints about um, using using the recursion? Why are um, other zero-knowledge projects are not necessarily using recursion? Well, there's a few reasons because some of them are just technical constraints. One of them is that it's actually pretty hard to design recursion. You have to think about it from the beginning and you sort of want to integrate it tightly with your proof system because embedding this verification operation into constraints can be prohibitively expensive. If you're not designing for it upfront, 
trying to layer this concept that you can do the verification of a zero knowledge proof inside of a zero knowledge like circuit, so like to use that term, um, then, uh, you know, it, you, you really are stuck with a situation where it's just not efficient at all. There is another thing when you compare it to folding, because the most expensive operation here is the, the sort of two operations you do when you generate proof, when you do a proof, you have the witness generation. We call these inputs the witness to a proof. And then it's actually generating the proof itself. This part right here is the most expensive part of the computation. If you do folding, then what you're doing is you're actually sharing all the witness generation up front and you have to do that in times, but you only have to generate proof one time for that aggregation. Whereas with recursion, you're going to have to keep on generating that proof over and over and over again. And I'll talk a little bit later about how you do more efficient recursion structures and how Mina tries to make it more efficient. But in the most naive way, if you're just doing like linear recursion, where it's just like one proof feeds into the next, um, this becomes really expensive. You're having to build O of N proofs in order to aggregate proofs together, right? So that's not very efficient. Is it just cost or also speed? Well, both. I mean, cost and speed generally are the same thing. That there's two angles of cost. One is performance and one is like um, RAM, I guess. You know, performance basically you just throw more hardware at it to make it faster and that's where cost comes from. RAM is just like how large your witness is. I would say that in the realm of recursive zero knowledge proofs, you're more talking about just the performance cost. The, the RAM cost is just how big your witness is, how complicated your constraints are, basically. And there are ways to get around that, which we can talk about later, maybe if we want to talk about chunking at the end. Okay, so now let's talk about blockchains. We're going to talk about, you know, what a blockchain is and how you can actually apply zero knowledge proofs to a blockchain in order to get some really interesting properties. So essentially the way you can think about a blockchain is that a blockchain is just a state transition model, okay? So just some diagram I'm going to use for state transition models when I'm talking about it. A state transition model or state transition machine is basically when you just have some concept of states and then you have some concept of transitions and you can apply a transition from one state to get to another. And the way a blockchain works is we think about these states as ledgers, okay? This is basically the state of everybody's accounts, you know, what their balance are. And then the transitions are actually the blocks themselves, okay? And that's made up of many transactions, which are sort of like smaller transitions, which are all being aggregated together into blocks. And so if we draw this out, you know, the way we can think about it is that a blockchain is starting from some genesis state, state zero, and then we apply a block to it. And then we get state one, and we apply another block to it. We're getting state two, and we just keep on doing this over and over and over again. Where each of these blocks is like a big step transition that is made up of a whole bunch of smaller step transitions, right? These are transactions individually applied to substates of S0. We're getting another ledger, we're getting another ledger, we're getting another ledger. But this block is the grouping of them, it's the ordering of them that we're going to commit to doing them on the network. So naively, if we wanted to take this and we wanted to prove this, we have to think about these small step transitions here first. Let me draw these as like lowercase t's. Um, so let's just take a look at one smaller state transition and a simple like payment based blockchain. Let's say we have a ledger and there's two accounts in the ledger. There's account A and account B. This ledger has some root, which we're basically storing as the state. And let's say that A wants to send, you know, five currency to B, right? So basically what we're doing here is we're going to subtract five currency from A and we're going to add five currency to B in order to to satisfy this operation, okay? Well, we could actually do this as a zero knowledge proof, right? All we're doing in a zero knowledge proof is we're saying, oh, A is somewhere in the ledger and B is somewhere in the ledger. And then if we actually apply that transaction, then we have a new ledger with the same A and B, but we've actually, you know, taken these values and then we've applied them to A and B, right? And that's basically the operation that we're proving. Okay, so this can be one zero knowledge proof. So it makes sense so far? So it's just a very simple state transition. And then what we're doing is we're taking all these transactions and we're gonna apply them all in a sequence. So if we have state 
S0, 0, and then we apply T1, T0 to it. Now we have state S0, 1, and then we apply T1 to it. We have state S0, 2, and at the end, we're left with some final version of S0, which now we're going to call S1, okay? So in other words, what we're doing is if we had three transactions in a block, we're going to generate one zero knowledge proof, two zero knowledge proofs, three zero knowledge proofs, and then that's basically our block. That's our state transition for our block, okay? Um, and so if we draw this out, it's literally like transaction zero is feeding in a proof along with the state that it created. I'll do this. Ends the proof for T1, which is then committing to the next one in the sequence, right? This is basically our recursion. This is linear recursion because what we're doing is we're feeding in the proof of the last transaction we applied to the next transaction we're applying to continue producing states. In addition to that, there is also one final proof that we have to do at the top, which is basically block proof here, because blocks in a blockchain, which we'll talk about more uh, later, are basically uh, attesting to information related to consensus as well. Like how long is this block in the blockchain? Like if we look at this whole chain, we wanna know that this block right here is actually two in length and this one's one in length, right? And we have to keep on aggregating that kind of information as well as additional information that's gonna prove that this block was valid mean as a proof of stake consensus layer. And what that means is that you actually use your stake to have the ability to win blocks. And so part of what this blockchain proof is gonna say is that the person producing this block actually had the right to produce this block at, a, at this point in time. And so we're left with all these sub-transition proofs, which are aggregated back up into a block proof. And we just have this one proof for every block. That's the full state transition from S0 to S1. And then we just keep on doing that. All the block proofs are feeding into each other as well question because i don't know if it was captured for the mic was how where are the zero knowledge proofs stored we'll talk about that more when we actually talk about um how the network is coordinating to prove all this information the important information is that only proofs you're interested in in general is the most recent blockchain proof so in terms of like yeah in terms of where they're stored um they're temporarily stored on the network we don't actually even archive the proofs though because they're not important this proof right here already verifies this proof in other words, we imagine that we're way in the future. We're talking about some block 1000. Block 1000 has verified block one and block two and block three. So there's no reason to actually keep all those proofs around because we've already aggregated all the proofs together. Um, so all the network does is store the most recent proofs that the network is sort of coming to consensus on that are still being settled on the chain. And then as that's being aggregated up into the block proofs, we just throw them all out. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, before I move on, I'm going to move on and talk about how this actually works in the Vena chain because this is not how it works in the Vena chain. This is a very naive form of linear recursion. Every single time we do one transaction proof, we have to wait for the last transaction proof to come in, right? And so in that world, that really limits our throughput because the number of transactions we have in blocks is, in other words, we have to do all n of those to produce the block, right? That's not very fast. It's sequential. And we can never really scale the blockchain because of that. And so in Mina, instead, we do something fancier to basically parallelize over all of these transaction proofs and do the transaction proofs in parallel to the blockchain proving. So we're going to actually separate these two layers out. Ready? So if we separate this into two concepts, Really what the chain's doing is the chain is proving two things at once, okay? Up here at the block layer, we're proving consensus information. And we'll talk more about how consensus works later. But then there's this separate layer down here where we're proving the state transition model, which is basically our transaction layer, okay? And so if we separate these two, we can start to think about the state transition model, which is the heavier part to prove concurrently to the consensus model. The consensus model is always going to have linear recursion. You always need the previous block before you can produce the next one. You always need the previous block proof before you can include the next one. So this is locked into linear recursion, okay? But in the state transition model, even though 
all the transactions themselves are linear. We don't have to build the proofs in a linear sequence. We can actually build them in parallel. So to understand this, you can think about the transactions. You can think about it like this. Let's say that one block just has four transactions in it. We can go through and we can generate the witnesses, basically the inputs to each of these transactions before we generate any of the proofs. This is a very quick operation. This is what's happening on Bitcoin all the time. We're just applying the transactions and we're seeing what happens just on a computer. And so we can understand that for transaction zero, if we just go through and apply all these, we can figure out what all these states are before we generate any of the proofs. We know that we need these two states for transaction zero. We need these two states for transaction one, these two for transaction two, and these two for transaction three. So once the network has done this, if any nodes of the network have gone through and applied these transactions manually, they know what the witnesses are to generate these. And now each node separately can generate proofs of these transactions. But now we still have four proofs and we just want one proof at the end because we're trying to include one proof back up into this block. So our goal is to get that one proof that we can include into the block because, well, let me point to this one for a second because maybe it'll make more sense. Because essentially the blockchain proof is taking in two recurves of zero knowledge proofs. It's taking in the prior blockchain's proof and it's also taking in the proof of the transactions that are within this block, okay? And so what the network can do is the network can actually do binary recursion on each of these to merge them into each other. And so in a sense, if this one here is a proof of S0 to S1, and this proof here is a proof of S1 to S2, this one here is now a proof of S1, sorry, S0 to S2, because we've combined the two together. We checked that S1 was the same, that basically the target of this proof matched the source of this proof, and then we just merge them together recursively. And the same thing over here, we know that this one is a proof of S2 to S4. And then finally at the top, we're left with a proof of S0 to S4. And so when we include that in our block, we can now do our big step transition as a single recursive zero knowledge proof that's included in the block. So I'll talk more about how we do this in true parallel later, but you can already see at each layer, we have four parallel pieces of work that are available here, two that are available here, and then finally one that's available here. And we do a trick to basically parallelize this so it's not just always, you know, changing over time how much parallel work you have available in the network. The trick here is that you still, in this model, have to do all of this work before this block is produced. And so that doesn't actually really work very well. Instead, what we have to do is a block, let's say it's this one now for a second, just as an example. A block is going to commit to what these transactions are and then these will be included in a future block. In other words, there's some kind of delay gap on the network that's happening between when the transactions are sequenced and when they're actually proven inside of a block. Have you ever heard of like the stage ledger and the Stark ledger? This is the difference between those ledgers. The stage ledger is the ledger in which transactions have been enqueued but not proven. The Stark ledger is the ledger in which transactions have been proven. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk more about this in detail and, and the next. Uh, panel, but any questions about this before we move on? Um, maybe it'll come up later, but are there any issues to do with, uh, say, collisions or ordering uh, in this model? No, because essentially what consensus is, is consensus is a way that the network achieves a shared understanding around what the ordering is. So uh, we'll talk a little more about it later, but let's say, you know, there's like multiple blocks which may have different orderings from each other, but in the end, only one blockchain is gonna live on. And so each of these blockchains can project a different ordering sequence, but within whatever chain you're currently working on and you believe is the strongest chain that you're operating on top of and the network is continuing to operate on top of, um, there is one defined sequence because some prior block has defined the exact sequence we know the exact sequence that's going to be proven down here, and that's just agreed to for every prior, every future block that's built on top of it. Does that make sense? But 
that is basically what consensus is for. Consensus is the solution to the ordering problem. If everybody orders things differently, then it's, it's not going to work. And so you have to achieve consensus on the various orderings that people agree to. Um, this is a st stupid question, um, but the reason why we, in each transaction, we require zero knowledge proof is because of the off-chain off computation and we don't have a virtual machine that does it on top of our blockchain. No. The, we're talk right now, we're not at the point where we have programmability in the blockchain. We're talking about just payments. Mm -hmm. So all of this is happening on-chain. There's no off-chain computation right now. We're only talking about on-chain computation, things that are happening on nodes on the network. But it's not, it's not virtual machine computation. Like Ethereum has a virtual machine that runs smart contracts, but they also just have regular machine code that they've deployed that's running the transaction logic for payments and things like that, right? So right now we're talking about sort of the baked in part of the program that people are running on the network. We're now at the point where we're running virtual machines that run arbitrary user code. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about that tree that I drew before, right? I mentioned there's like four layers at the bottom, there's two layers and then one layer. The problem with that is that if you just use that as the structure that you're basically doing things on the network in, you end up with a network where the saturation of work is constantly oscillating like a sine wave, right? In other words, when we first enqueue the transactions, we're up here at the maximum level of parallelism. But as we keep on going down the layers of the tree, we eventually get here where there's only one proof to do, okay? This really isn't what we want. This is not how we actually want to build a network because what's going to happen is people are going to spin up machines here and there's going to be some delay. People are going to spin them down. It's not profitable anymore because there's not enough work to do in parallel. The whole point is that we want a whole bunch of servers in the network to be doing these things individually in parallel. And so what we want is we want something that's going to look a little bit more flat. In reality, it's not quite flat. Maybe it's moving up for demand and moving down as demand comes, but it's sort of staying around this line based purely on demand. We don't want it to be oscillating up and down regardless of demand, okay? And so there's this neat trick you can do where you're still working on these trees, but instead of having one tree at a time, you basically have multiple trees. Oh, I drew that tree too big. And so let's still imagine that each of these trees is like, you know, three layers deep for now, four, two, and one. If you, oops, sorry. If you have all these trees at once instead of just one tree, you can actually control the sequencing logic for these trees and the work that needs to be done in the network such that each tree, you're working on a different layer of the tree, okay? So let's say this tree over here, we're working on the bottom layer. So here we have four pieces of work. And then here we're working on the middle layer, so there's two pieces of work. And here we're just working on the top layer, so there's one. Well, in a sense, if you think about this picture, you can just combine all these trees together and you have one tree. You have one tree all the time. But by having multiple trees in different parts of the computation, you're keeping a constant amount of work that can be saturated on the network at any point in time, and you get something that's more like this. It, as there's more transactions, you know, there is some increased work because there's more throughput, but the amount of possible work that can be done by anybody on the network is the same at any point in time, right? And so, in a sense, each of these trees is coming from different blocks in the blockchain. So it, it, this is not quite true. There's actually some tricks that it's not always true, but let's say each of these trees contains all the transactions for a single block. It's like this block inserted into this tree, this block inserted into this tree, this block inserted into this tree. The state that you're seeing here of each of these trees being proven is actually from this block's viewpoint, right? Because we've already finished this layer when we did this block. And then we finished this layer when we did this block, right? And so you essentially, what, what you really get at the end, the way you can ultimately think about it is that there's just a queue of work. There's a queue of transactions coming in and there's a queue of work. There's a de de definite ordering on the order that work has to be completed in by the network. Block producers have to include that work before they get more space for more transactions. I can't allocate a new tree here until I finish this tree. So. I have to finish this tree to make more space. And I also can't ha include any work from this layer of this tree until this layer and this layer are done, right? So there's a, there becomes like a definite ordering on all the transactions, the order they need to be applied in, but not just that, also the order that all the work has to be done in by the network. There becomes this marketplace between block producers 
and snark workers, where block reducers are living up here in the consensus layer. And snark workers are proving the state transition model. They're all working in parallel on the network, where snark workers can sell the proofs back to block producers, and block producers pay the snark workers from the transaction fees they're including. So they're including transaction fees, they're getting coin bases, and they're distributing rewards back to the snark workers for their efforts of selling proofs back to the block producer. The block producer needs that work. It cannot continue including transactions if it doesn't buy that work. In fact, if you purchase no work and the queue is full, you can't even make a coin base. So you may have seen issues on the network where sometimes you can't get a coin base. Ultimately, these are usually issues with either the snark work not being available on the network because people have had an issue or with some network issues related to the networking stack right now that we're fixing. And so this definite queue of work becomes this tool that the network is using to coordinate all the parallel work that's going on for Stark proving. Um, in a sense, the state transition model of Mina is not just a state transition model between the ledgers. It's actually a state transition model between this very complicated queue data structure too. Every block is not just saying, hey, this is the ledger I you know, started with, and this is the ledger I ended with. The block is actually saying, this is the ledger I started with, and this is the work queue I started with, and this is the ledger I ended with, and this is the remaining work queue that I ended with. Does that make sense? That's sort of what the state transition Amina is. In addition to that, we're actually tracking two ledgers in Amina. I mentioned this before already. But if we're thinking about, this is all sort of from this block's viewpoint right now, what this looks like. We have two ledgers, which is the snark ledger is the ledger right here. It's the ledger that we started applying transactions to. But all these transactions are still being proven. They're not proven yet. And so the ledger that we get at the very end of applying all these transactions, this is the stage ledger. And there, this is the delay I was talking about. This is basically the asynchronous delay, is that there's a Snark ledger that's being updated every time that one of these trees is finished. And every time transactions are included, the stage ledger is being updated, and there's a short, finite distance gap between these two things at any point in time. Two questions. Uh, so first of all, how to ensure the, the balance between block producer and stack workers? Obviously, block producers get the coin base, but would not make sense for stack worker to turn into block producers or the other way around? How, how does Mina ensure that? Balance? Well, that's that's the financial incentives of Snark workers. So um, there are is a case right now, which we're working on fixing it. I can go into it later. Maybe it has to do with um, taxes and some misunderstandings, but where some Snark workers are selling Snark work for zero on the network. Um, and so in that case, their incentive is sort of, um, they're also running block producers. They need the work which is not how the network's intended to work. Um, the way they're doing that primarily is for tax purposes because they get paid out for Snark work every single block and they decided it costs too much money to do the tax work. So they just charge zero. It's very interesting. Um, there's also another reason, which is that some people misunderstand that model where they think that if they charge money, then they'll lose money, which is a weird misunderstanding that some people have in the community. Um, they're like, oh, I need to Snark work on my block producer. I want my block producer to buy it. So I'm going to sell it at zero to my block producer. But the truth is, you should just attach money to it because if you buy it from yourself, you paid yourself the money you bought it for, like it didn't go anywhere, right? Um, whereas if you attach a fee to it and somebody else is the one who includes it in the block, then you make money. So these two different reasons, like taxes and misunderstanding, lead people to put Snark work at zero. I'm curious to see what's going to happen with Berkeley now that Snark work is more expensive. It's going to cost more for them and there's going to be more of an incentive to actually put a price back on there again. Um, but when there was only payments, Snark work was so cheap to do that people just, it wasn't worth their taxes, basically, right? It, it was not an expensive thing to run a Snark worker and actually produce the work for the network. There wasn't enough money to be made there. But the, the actual reason is basically the financial incentive marketplace. It is the idea that block producers need this. They're willing to pay for it. That's true regardless. The only reason Snark workers aren't doing it is because they're unwilling to charge for it, which is a different issue, right? Um, as long as they're producing work, though, that's great. And if all the Snark workers that were producing zero-fee works disappeared overnight, people who are not producing zero fee works would actually come back online and make a profitable model of it. You can basically charge whatever you want to, as long as the block producer is able to pay for it. The block producer has a very big coin base. They have a lot of money that they can actually spend to pay for the, that work. And what's happening right now is that 
you know, the competition is just push it down so much. The re, you know, the way the network's work is pushed down so much. But imagine all those zero fee snark works disappeared. It doesn't mean people would stop producing snark work. It just means that people would actually be able to charge for it again. Um, how hard is it technically to set up a set up and become a snark snark worker? Is it um, can all the validators basically run similar program and participate yeah. as a snark worker? It so the the architecture the way it works is you basically run a snark coordinator, which is a regular Mina node. So that's the same as running a block producer or a seed node or any kind of regular Mina node. And then the only extra work on top of that is that you run a bunch of snark workers that are attached to that coordinator doing the work in parallel for that coordinator. So setting it up infrastructure wise, it's actually not that difficult. It's basically two programs you're running. You're running one instance of one program and then like n instances of another program um, with modern cloud like you know providers. It's pretty easy to do, honestly. Um, I think it would be more annoying if you were running physical hardware servers, but that's not generally what people are doing. Um, even then it's, it's not, it, there's not a lot of technical requirements to it. The, the main difficult requirements are all on the node that you run, which you already have to do to participate in the network. So it's not it's not really much extra work to run Snark workers underneath that node and have that node be a coordinator. It's worth mentioning you can have any node be a coordinator. We don't our node roles are not distinct. You can run a block producer that's also a coordinator at the same time, and people do that a lot. What about the transaction kind of? for confirmation. You mentioned here that potentially there might be some case that, you know, the first block that is valid, the, the latest block that is being verified that has transaction, but, you know, there is the Bitcoin in it at least. Um, yeah. To have the full confirmation, you need a few blocks. How does it work with Mina? And we need to get that, you know, 99.9%. So, okay, there's two numbers. Well, there's a few numbers. Here's the here's the issue with that is that there's, um, we use Ouroboros, which I'll talk more about later. Ouroboros is a probabilistic proof, uh, sorry, probabilistic consensus mechanism. So it's similar to the Nakamoto consensus, but because it's not proof of work based, because it's proof of stake based, and it's not a BFT validator cycle, you actually have a very long number of confirmations for the 99.99999% finality. So if you really want to wait for the absolute finality, what we refer to as absolute finality, it's pretty long. It's 290 blocks. Um, but the truth is that you don't need to wait that long because you can get 99.9% .9 finality in about 15. So the, it, there becomes sort of this gradient trade-off where if you really want to have absolute finality, like the way the protocol works, the way that like things that deeply integrate with the protocol work is they're looking at this longer finality pull of 290 right now. But most applications operating on it, like exchanges and applications that actually have financial incentives to not have reorgs happen that are going to screw up things they've already done, they only look back 15. That's, that's usually what people look back. That gives you the same probability as Bitcoin. Bitcoin's probability is less than Ouroboros's. But Ouroboros, for reasons, has to have a higher probability. It's very technical and related to consensus. And if you're building an application on it, you basically never worry about it. It's like, you know, you've got like 100 years before you're going to hit that edge case. You know what I mean? But Ouroboros is designed to work in, you know, 10,000 million years, whatever, you know, it's just, it will never hit that edge case. So that's why we use 290. So uh, I know it's a little complicated answer. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually two questions. Uh, the first about the legal issue, uh, well, data is worth saying that, um, the snark process is actually considered as proof of work mining, uh, because of the verified randomness. Uh, but where is the randomness actually plays role in the start process and then why it is considered in mind? There's no verified randomness in there. They're only in the on production. Yeah, I don't know. That's like what I don't I don't understand. Like why it is called as mining in the legal terms, the start process, because that's why taxes are so high. I've never heard this before. I think that's a misunderstanding of how the protocol works. It's definitely not mining. Yeah, yeah. I think the same too. But like, you know, that's the reason they say the legals are high. So... I think that whoever gave them tax advice didn't understand the protocol. Shit. <laughs> that's, that's honestly my take on that. Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's like definitely not mining. There's no randomness involved with it. There's no lottery. There's no chance to produce it or not produce it. Anybody can come and do the work. And it's fundamentally very different than mining. It's basically what cloud providers are doing. It should be taxed the same as what, a, you know, a, any SaaS service is doing because you're running software as a service and you're selling it back to the network. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a huge relief, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely not mining. That's crazy. 
Um, and the second one, uh, what is the communication layer between the snark workers and the uh, validators that buy the proof? Like how do they communicate and how do we assure liveness there? So the there's two mempools in the network. There's one mempool for transactions and there's one mempool for snark work. So the snark workers are submitting snark work they've completed back to the network's mempool layer, the gossip layer. They're gossiped around the network. And the mempool, similar to like transactions, you know, you're keeping only the higher fee transactions. You're keeping only the lower fee snark works. And so it's basically a very simple operation. When you receive a snark work via gossip, you're like, oh, for this specific work in the pool, because you know, you know exactly what work exists in the pool that needs to be completed. Do I have a lower fee already? And then you throw it out, or is this lower and then I take it? Um, does that answer your question? There's no direct connection to the validators, it's the entire gossip network that is providing all the snark work. Uh, so the selling process of snarks is also a transaction in the network, no ways? Uh, it's not a transaction, but it's gossiped in the same way transactions are. Uh, and then they get the money to their MENA account, right? That it exists in the States. Yes. So uh, is it included in a future block, the payment? Uh, it's included immediately. It's just not proven until a future block. So at the, at the point in time where a block producer buys that stock work, they're immediately having to, and it's proven in, as part of our snark proofs, they immediately have to transfer the relevant MENA to that snark mm -hmm. order. Uh, and uh, do they connect to the layer through an RPC of validators, or are they like light nodes, snark workers? Well, snark workers are actually not nodes. There are snark coordinators, which are nodes that coordinate work among a whole bunch of workers. Um, they're not light nodes. They are full nodes. They participate in consensus. Um, they are just not producing blocks. Uh, if I was a snark worker uh, on this example, uh, can I start to produce a snark proof for the future blocks? So because I can see the all transactions in the first block, and do I have to wait until the third block to come to produce its proof, or can I start producing its proofs for the future? So you can't start producing the proof for transactions that haven't been added yet. But even though each of these layers here is being worked on in different orders, this is just the ordering sequence. I don't have to wait for that sequence to be achieved by a block producer. As soon as this transaction's in here, I can start working on this. But the problem is I need the lower proofs to know what it looks like to merge that up, okay? So in a sense, as soon as somebody does this proof and this proof on the network, and I see those, I can immediately build this one, yeah. okay? So you can eagerly produce snark work well ahead of when it's required by the network. Um, you just, the only thing you can't do is you, I mean, you could try, but it just wouldn't work, uh, is to produce snark work for transactions that haven't been included in the blocks yet. So once the transaction's been included in the block, it's free game to work on any snark work that's in the queue. Each of the transaction has a specific fee for it. Uh, what about the second layer and the third layer, l layer of that tree, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a high incentive to do those or is it? You're not paid with the transaction fee of the, so the snark work fee that you're charging is not paid for from the transaction you're proving it for. It's paid for with future transactions because block producers need snark work to make space. The snark work has to be included in blocks. Block producers have to do that to make money. If they don't include snark work in blocks, they will not make money. And so the snark, it's the block producer's job to find a way to pay for that work from all the transaction fees in that block. You basically, I mean, the way it literally works is like, in a block, you take your Coinbase and all the transaction fees you get, that is the total sum you made to that block. And you have to use that money to pay out snark workers, but also you can include less transactions if you don't buy enough snark work. And block producers actually do this, they run this algorithm where they're like, oh, if I buy this work, is it gonna let me include enough fees that I'm making profit? And there becomes this sort of like profit push and pull thing that's going on inside of uh, block producers where they're like, actually, I'm gonna stop right here and wait for a cheaper work because this work they're trying to charge is too expensive and I'm not going to actually make my money back from future fees I'm going to include in this block. Mm. That's part of the marketplace. But thus far, because the snark marketplace, snark place has been just zero fee, Yeah, it's it's been, there hasn't been such situation. Well, there has been. Um, during times of high throughput on the network, like after uh, epochs happen where people do all these staking reward payouts, actually you do see snark fees come up. Um, snark workers do end up charging non-zero snark fees and they do include in blocks. 
And sometimes you'll even see, because people take advantage of this when there's a lot of congestion on the network, this actually should not be as much of an issue in Berkeley because um, we've tested this in Berkeley. But uh, one of the things that would happen is when the network would get too congested with all these transactions, the gossip network would not work super well. And so it became a little inconsistent, the gossip around this information. So some snark workers would come online and charge really high fees. Like they charge tens, if not hundreds of MENA for that. And a block producer would be forced to include it because otherwise they wouldn't get their coin base at all. And block producers usually have an algorithm that just catches the lowest fee for the snark, uh, snark snarks. At every, because there's that mempool model, every node is only listening to and keeping the lowest fees on the network. They're throwing out any high fee ones as long as they've seen it. The thing is when the gossip becomes inconsistent, which once again is much better on the new network, um, then they can take advantage of that because you haven't actually seen all the work that was out there because maybe you missed it due to gossip inconsistencies. So. So I'm going to take a little pause on all the technical details to talk about what are the properties that we've gotten so far by building the blockchain in this way, right? Like, why are we doing all this zero-knowledge uh, proof stuff? Um, why are we doing it all in parallel? I'm going to talk about that really quick. So I'm going to compare Ethereum and Mina, but really this is a placeholder for any blockchain. Um, I'm using picking on Ethereum. The, most of these things are true for um, Bitcoin as well, but I'm picking on it because it's the most similar. It has an account-based model. And most other chains are based on Ethereum, not Bitcoin. Um, so there's sort of like two interesting axes that we want to think about things from is like the cost of verifying information and the cost of storing information. So uh, I'm going to talk about it in terms of O score. I think everybody's familiar with big O notation. Um, okay. So basically for anybody who's on the uh, video, big O notation is just a way to describe the way that operations scale. So if I say... O of n, that basically means like it's scaling linearly. The more stuff there is, the longer it takes or the more data you have to store. If something scales O of 1, it means that regardless of how much more stuff there is, it's just, you know, it's constant time. It's constant storage space. Okay. So when we're looking at Ethereum, Ethereum, if we want to verify all the blocks, we have to look at all n blocks. And within all those blocks, there's all the transactions, and we have to look at all n transactions. We basically have to go through all n blocks, all n transactions, and reapply them from the beginning to figure out what the current state is. Um, this is so prohibitively expensive on Ethereum, it would take many, many weeks of a very powerful, expensive computer to do this, that people just have learned to trust the chain. They just trust those they, they contact. They just trust that the network has operated correctly in the past. Um, in theory, if the, entire, if the network had a very short period of time where there was a cartel that was agreeing to do something bad, you wouldn't know in the future unless you redo this operation. You're, you're putting a lot of trust into the network itself. In addition to that, because you need to have all this information around, you have to constantly store all in blocks and all in transactions. And you have to store all in accounts because the accounts are the state that you're applying everything to. Okay? Comparing the MENA, and MENA, because we have this recursive zero knowledge proof that's already proven all the blocks, we only need to do it in O1 to check the blocks because you're just checking the proof of the blocks, which also means you're checking the transactions. So that's O1. And because you don't have to keep them around, the network doesn't need to store them. So it's O1 in terms of storage of blocks and transactions as well. The network doesn't have to actually grow in storage space requirements as the network is continuing to operate. And so it scales into the future basically forever. That never changes. This constant amount of storage requirements and constant amount of verification time is the same. The only factor in which MENA scales O of N is accounts. But what I would say is that this is fine, right? Because, you know, the high throughput here is blocks and transactions. This is every interaction anybody ever does with a chain. The number of accounts is just how many people are operating with the chain, how many apps are on the chain. And so this is sort of the least important of all these scaling factors in a sense. So MENA doesn't erase this. You do need all the accounts. You need that whole ledger store of the nodes, but you'll need the most recent ledger. You don't have to store, you know, even the, really the original ledger. Everybody knows the Genesis ledger, but it's not actually important from the perspective of joining the chain. What these properties here get you is this amazing light client story where you can come and you can join the network from your mobile phone, from a web browser. You could join it from a satellite in space, as we are talking about recently. <laughs>
and and so uh the idea is like because it becomes really cheap to join the network trustlessly it completely removes this aspect of ethereum where you have to only run full nodes and otherwise you have to trust right if you're in the browser you can't do any of this stuff if you're in a mobile phone you can't do any of this stuff you can't even download this data let alone actually run the computation it would take like a year for a mobile phone probably that's just a number i pulled out of my ass but like that's I don't think it's entirely unrealistic. It would take a very long time to do that. And nobody would ever do that. They don't want to spend that amount of time checking the network. Every time the network moves forward, you have to redo parts of that computation. And so the big advantage of Mina with the recursive zero knowledge proofs is not just scalability of the chain itself. It's also the ability to just be able to join the chain with any device anywhere very quickly. This operation to download an individual block and then check the proof is very, very short. It's like tens of milliseconds of time to actually do the verification. Um, so, the, and that's for the light nodes, correct? It's for full nodes too. Full nodes too? Yeah. Even full nodes. So this one just means it's constant, okay? Uh, the amount of data you have to download from a full node is a bit more than the amount of data you have to download from a light node, okay? because you have to download all the accounts mm. and you actually have to download K blocks. That's like 290. It's not quite K, the, at least K. We'll just say K for now. It's If you're looking at forks, sometimes you download more. But you download K blocks. But the, the thing is that this K is not moving. This is a constant number. It's not scaling as you have more blocks. The network only has to keep the K most recent blocks. Blocks For a full node, you're downloading K, but K is still constant. It's still OM1, okay? Uh, so in the 22 kilobytes, the famous, um, do we include all the accounts or uh, it's just the constant size? And if you include all the accounts, um, doesn't the account count increase like dramatically when there are ZK apps because we also should store the states of ZK apps? So, okay, let me talk about the 22 kilobyte thing real quick. So the 22 kilobyte number is kind of interesting. It's not the data you need to sync a full node to the chain. This is what 22 kilobytes is. 22 kilobytes is downloading a block header it's downloading the proof for a block that you check against the block header. The block header is basically the public input to that. That's what the proof is certifying. And it's also downloading one account from the ledger and doing a Merkle proof for it. Okay, so in other words, 22 kilobytes is the amount of data you need to check one account, okay? It's actually less than 22 kilobytes if you're just trying to check the chain, okay? So this is the way I like to think about it. It's about, I think, don't quote me on this, but it's about 11 kilobytes to get the block and the proof for the block. And then any account that you want to look up, like per account, you're doing like another doing like another 10 kilobytes. I think maybe it's nine or something. I forget the exact numbers. It's around there. So the answer is 22 changes based on how many accounts you're verifying from that state. The real thing is that it takes 11 kilobytes of data and 10 milliseconds, not tens of milliseconds of time to basically check the block. And then you can request individual accounts from the ledger that that block's verifying. And each of those accounts you're downloading is like some few more kilobytes of data. Um, in the Mina full nodes, whole accounts are always available, right? Yeah. In all accounts. Yes. So in a Mina full node, to sync to the chain, you have to download all the accounts in the ledger. Um, I think the ledger is like hundreds of megs right now. So it's not terribly large. Um, with ZK apps, it does get a little more, right? As you have more ZK apps. That's part of the reason why on-chain storage is limited, is to help keep that number small. We'll still bump up on-chain storage in the future, most likely, um, almost certainly. But uh, that is sort of the trade-off there that you're making, is the number of accounts that you have in the ledger. You do have to have all those in the full node. But as I'm kind of arguing here, that's the least important scaling factor. That's like based only on how many people are using it, how many apps exist in the chain. You're always keeping constant for actually syncing to the chain. And then you can just look up the individual accounts that you need. And so even in like a very long time, let's say, I, I wish I had the numbers for this, but let's say the account was millions and millions and millions of ledger, but uh, uh, like the ledger was millions and millions and millions of accounts instead of like the hundreds of thousands of accounts we have right now. This is only going to be a handful of gigabytes. It's like two, three, five gigabytes of data, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is there a reason uh, specific for to choose eight state fields or it's just number you like? I don't know. I didn't choose eight. We were going to increase it. But then um, there were memory issues, so we didn't. So we can increase it in the future when we fix the memory issues. There are some memory issues right now with the node. That's why we have the soft limit. Somebody was asking about that earlier. Um, of like 24 ZK apps per block is also related to this memory issue. 
Um, it's not an unfixable memory issue. It's a memory issue only in technical implementation because uh, you actually don't need a lot of the information in RAM. This is like information that's accessed very infrequently. So we're just naively storing a lot of information in RAM right now. Um, all you need to do is write it to disk. And once again, that amount of data is not in. That amount of data is O of 1. So it's a constant size amount of data. It's just once we threw ZK apps in, because ZK apps are a lot larger, that constant size grew to like, you know, tens and tens of gigabytes of data you have to store in RAM. You can store those tens and tens of gigabytes on disk instead. But you throw it out over time. It like, as the network progresses, you throw out the old data. Um, and you really don't need all this data to join the network. You only need the account information and the K blocks to join the network. This is information you accumulate as you're verifying new blocks coming in and doing stark work and things like that. So it's like ephemeral data unrelated to the ledger. Um, when we say the verification cost of transactions, you said it's all of one, but I need to download an account to verify the transaction history, or can I like download some partial amount and verify the, that? When you check the block proof, you verified all transactions of all accounts. But we don't need the account, uh, either the account was to verify because it was a private input to the start. The public statement the Stark is making is just the Merkle root. So the Merkle root is being publicly attested to, but all of those accounts that were fed into, like the accounts are basically the states that were created from the transitions from Genesis, right? And so all of that information is actually folded into the private inputs of all the Stark proofs. So you don't need the server with the proof. The only information you're actually checking with the proof is that Merkle root. And that's attesting to all the accounts. So I don't need to download all the accounts to verify them that proof verified all in accounts for me. And once I look up an account that's related to that Merkle ledger and I do that Merkle proof, that's this piece of information here that like some like 10 or less kilobytes of data I had to download to get the account plus the Merkle proof for the account. Um, then I know that's connected back to the Merkle root and I know that that was part of the statement that the Stark was building. Cool. Um, but for Snark proofs, the verification time is constant, but the um, proof size is not, so it depends on the accounts. So no. Kimchi is constant size proof. Huh. And also constant size verification. Yes. All these generation time that increases number of accounts. No. What else increases? Um, when you're doing an individual proof, you're only doing uh, two Merkle lookups in the source ledger and two Merkle lookups in the target ledger. With ZK apps, we break that up into a whole bunch of account updates where each account update can only look at one Merkle root in the source ledger and one Merkle root in the target ledger. That's like the transition of that account, right? Um, but we break those up into individual chunks and then prove them separately. Going back to this, um, so would the chain work without any problems without archive nodes? And if so, how archive nodes kind of fit in it? It is just for historical lookup or is there any other advantage of having archive nodes? Yeah, archive nodes are only for historical lookup. The chain does not need archive nodes. Archive nodes are not required for consensus. They're essentially a sidecar to the network. So, you know, people are incentivized to run archive nodes because they want to run explorers. They want to see the history. And that history can be proven back to the most recent block as well. Proving historical information back to the most recent block costs O of N in terms of transactions that you've done on that account since then. However, that's like only in the case where you're doing a historical proof of information on something that happened way in the past. Usually the way you're building a ZK app is you actually have this statement you're building up every single time. So you only need to look at the most recent statement. So it's generally you design around this. So some applications, some ZK apps may rely on archive node, but you can design your ZK apps to not rely on archive node, which is what you should be trying to do. Um, but the network itself, the consensus layer, absolutely does not need any archive nodes to run. You could run the entirety of Mina with zero archive nodes. The network still works fine. I see. And then for the case of RPC, you still in the full node have access to last 250, well, K nodes, yeah. uh, K logs. So in exactly. theory, you still have access to an archive of the latest archive. Um, so one question I got during the break was, uh, I should have explained this better, why are we doing all this work in parallel? Like, why do you not just prove all the transactions in a block immediately in one big zero-knowledge proof? Um, and the answer of that is basically scalability of transaction throughput and block proving time, right? The point is that we want to divorce block proving time from the throughput of the network such that we can scale the throughput of the network heavily regardless of, without affecting block proving time, right? 
In other blockchains, like Ethereum, they actually have this additional problem where their throughput is limited by how fast a ZKBM can run. In other words, the amount of transactions they can fit into a block will always be limited by how fast they want that block to be produced because it takes, they have to run through every transaction and execute every single ZKBM, uh, sorry, EVM operation on all of the smart contracts that are interact interacting in there. Mina's block time is only limited by the time it takes to apply transactions and none of those transactions include any kind of execution. So we're basically able to do this really cheap operation where we're just updating some things in the ledger and checking a couple of pieces of information. And that's the amount of time it takes to produce a block. And in fact, we actually do a lot of that verification ahead of time, like checking the proof and things when we put in the mempool. And we're just doing some really simple state checks when we apply transactions to blocks inside of Mina. And so we have this thing where we get the divorce execution of contracts from block time. And then we also get to do in parallel all the proving of those transactions without affecting block time as well. So that's why we spend so much time on parallelization. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about consensus because I talked about this, this great property, but we should talk about how our consensus mechanism actually enables this because this whole problem is like, well, okay, I can check a block and I'll have one, but how do I know it's the block? How do I know it's the one related to the network? And how are we actually proving inside of the block header that this block is the right block that I should be looking at? So really high level, I'm just gonna compare two different kinds of consensus mechanisms people are familiar with. You have Nakamoto consensus, which is typically based on proof of work. And you have um, BFT uh, proof of stake consensus, which is basically Byzantine fault tolerance. That's where you have proof of stake, but you basically elect validators at any point in time in the network and those validators produce blocks, okay? So in, I don't think I have to draw much for this, so I'll just talk. Um, in proof of work, Nakamoto consensus, basically the way that that works is you take the longest chain. You, you just take the whole thing and you turn it down to this longest chain rule. Proof of work is taking computational power in a sense. I guess I can draw this. Proof of work is taking computational power and it's divvying up your right to win blocks in the network. Wow, what a bad pie chart. Um, based on how much computational power that you have, right? And so the idea is that you want to distribute access to produce blocks and in proof of work, you're doing it on computation. That's all these slices of the pie is how much computation you're putting into the proof of work. And so the idea is that as long as like, you know, more than 50%, 51% at least is actually acting honestly on the network, then you can trust the chain. And what that means is that with 51% of the chain uh, of the computing power going to one version of the chain, you can just look at the longest chain, right? So that's the longest chain rule is basically what Nakamoto consensus relies on. Proof of stake is similar, except with proof of stake, what we're doing is we're trying to divvy up your right to win blocks based on the portion of the stake you control on the network. So instead of looking at your computational power, it's looking at the stake distribution. And there are a couple of different ways of solving this. One is to keep Nakamoto consensus, which is what Ouroboros does. And I'll revisit that in a second, but I'll talk about BFT for a second, okay? BFT is the popular solution for this. And the way the BFT works is that you look at all these different slices of the pie of people who are staking in BFT, and the network works together to elect the validator. So at any point in time, they say, okay, we're gonna run an election, all right, you won. So now for the next period of time, the next like few hours or however long they choose, they usually choose a shorter period of time, um, you're gonna produce all the blocks, okay? Now this puts risk on the network because if this person controlling this portion of the stake on the network doesn't actually uh, act honestly, or they just fail to produce blocks, the whole network is paused, the whole network is stopped. And so what BFT does is they do stake slashing where they're like, okay, well, you need to put some of your stake up and if you don't act well, then we're gonna get rid of your stake here, okay? That's basically how BFT works. Now, there's an issue with BFT when it comes to trying to do this recursive zero knowledge proof, okay? One issue is performance and efficiency. Doing this like whole validator election cycle basically involves getting signatures from most of the nodes in the network and then proving all those signatures. That can be really expensive to do in a start. It is doable, but that has been a limitation. But as starts get faster, you can actually do that reasonably, like especially with folding. You can fold all the signatures together into one witness, and then you can just say, hey, here's all the signatures, here's the election cycle. The problem with BFT, when you're adapting it into um, zero knowledge proofs, 
is that this stake slashing situation, imagine the situation in which somebody did not produce blocks. How do you prove somebody didn't produce blocks? You're proving a negative. You can't prove a negative, right? It's like an impossible thing. Maybe you could have a whole bunch of people sign signatures together to say like, ah, oh, this person didn't participate, but then you're just putting trust in this like signature coalition, which could just be a cartel of people that decided, hey, I don't like this validator. I want to get rid of them too. And so that's really not good. And this is a problem with a lot of BFT mechanisms. They're all basically relying on this historical trust. But if you're trying to use a zero knowledge proof to sync to the chain and say you have these properties, then you're really even going further down that road because anybody could go produce a zero knowledge proof that's sort of continuing the chain, ignoring blocks, right? I can just censor blocks arbitrarily for my zero knowledge proof. Does that make sense? What we want to have instead is we want to have something more like Nakamoto consensus because what Nakamoto consensus gives us is we have to prove the validity of a block, but then we get this simple rule to select between a series of blocks about which one's the most valid block, right? What was that? Yeah, the longest one. Well, it's, we'll get to that. It's more complicated than Ouroboros than the longest one. But the idea is the same, right? Naively, if instead we can take a proof of stake consensus, but then we could have some kind of longest chain-like rule, then what we do is we don't have to worry about the situation where we're proving a negative. Nobody has to get their stake slashed because lack of participation just means you're not in the chain. It means you're just missing out on money. It means you're just not participating in the honest portion of the network, which only has to be a certain percent of the network. Um, so the way that Ouroboros works is instead of actually doing these validator cycles, which puts all the risk on the network into one person at any point in time, and then having to worry about a way to slash the stake, right, because that person didn't behave correctly, we're instead basically letting everybody, it, if Ouroboros is an election, sorry, if, if BFT is an election, Ouroboros is a lottery, okay? In the same way that proof of work is like taking up that pie chart and distributing work among it. And that's basically the lottery, right? This is how proof of work works is like a lottery. We're doing the same thing with proof of stake. We're taking up all the different portions of stake and that's your chance to win every single block. But we divide blocks up into finite series of times called slots. And every single time there's a slot, every single person on the network participating in block production is going to basically roll a die locally in a sense. And if their die came up with a good enough number based on what their stake was, then they can produce that block. And so what happens here is that, you know, you get all these different forks where different people won different blocks. And if you notice, and unlike BFT, we have a situation that's more similar to proof of work where you can have multiple blocks being produced by different people at the same time because they both won the lottery. And in fact, in Ouroboros, it's very possible, more so than with proof of work, that you have like four or five blocks that all won the same slot, or perhaps slots where nobody won blocks, right? And so what this creates, in a sense, is a very forky network, right? We're going to keep on branching because different people have seen the block at different points in time, okay? This is the reason why probability, you were asking before about probability in, or in Ouroboros, this is why probabil probabilistic finality in Ouroboros tends to be longer than in like not regular Nakamoto consensus. In addition to that, we also have to think about some really unique problems in this kind of world because in proof of work, there's nothing I can do inside of a block to increase my chance to win a future block. But in proof of stake, there is. In proof of stake, if I censor other people's transactions, if I ignore Coinbase's other people got, like I choose a transaction history that didn't involve any of these people, and then I give myself a Coinbase, and then I give myself another Coinbase, I can basically get a denser and denser chain over time because I'm collecting all the stake in the network, okay? It creates the situation that we call a long fork attack. In other words, if the network runs for like a year or two, you get in a situation where somebody could always start back at Genesis and grind out a chain that is longer, is better than the best chain people are, the honest chain people are actually working on. Because what I've done is I've ignored all the coin bases they've gotten. And all I've done is create a long side chain for years that basically has accumulated a lot of stake in my account only. And now I control such a large portion of the network that I can produce blocks more densely than the honest portion of the network can. And so eventually I can beat the longest chain rule. And so Ouroboros captures a variety of metrics within the blocks, or rather, let me be specific. Ouroboros, the way Ouroboros solves this is, I'll draw this again real quick. You don't have to stop the camera. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna draw that long fork scenario because the idea is 
starting back at Genesis. The Honest Chain is going to look like this. It's going to be relatively sparse. This is too big. I usually have a bigger whiteboard. Let me just do it with dots. The, the Honest Chain down here at the bottom is going to have kind of a sparse layout for a long time. And the dishonest chain is going to be really sparse in the beginning because I didn't have much stake, but then it quickly starts to get really dense. And so the way that Ouroboros solves this problem is you go all the way back where these two chains forked right here, and you're basically sampling this period of time, and you're saying, well, look at this. This was not very dense in the beginning, so I believe this is a manipulated chain. In other words, you're not just caring about the longest chain rule. You're also caring about the density. Okay. Or a bonus requires you to look back at history and do this though. So what we did is we adapted this into another adaptation on top of Ouroboros called Ouroboros Samasika that adapts this concept into the, the uh, succinct setting where we basically have a metric that we store in the chain called the minimum window density. That's basically, what is the minimum density ever achieved by this chain? If you're looking now at this one over here, the metric for how dense this chain was at any point in time in the past, the minimum density I ever had, is going to be worse than this chain, and that's more important than the length of the blocks. There's a few other metrics involved here too. There's actually a lot of other stuff here, like there's a short fork attack where you do something very similar, where you manipulate like the seed of randomness that people are using to actually um, figure out whether or not they win, because there's like a random seed that has to go into every single slot check. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of like metrics and properties that are encapsulated inside of every block in Ouroboros that you can use to compare blocks. So it becomes a lot more complicated than the longest chain rule, but you get the same concept in a sense. You sort of have the longest chain rule, but you have some additional checks to it as well to make sure that the chain's not manipulated in some bad way. What you're left with... Oh, God. Um, may I ask, when the soft fork, when, when multiple forks happen, what happens to the start get place? Every fork has its own queue. When I'm operating on the, on the start get place, I'm doing the same operation every block reduce is doing, where I'm determining what the best block is, and I'm working off of that as the most recent state. So some snark workers might be on those little forks for a bit, but then will converge back to the main chain. Sometimes those works will still be relevant. Maybe the transactions are the same. Sometimes they won't be. But the idea is that you're always tracking the best block you've seen so far and working off of that. Because every block has its own queue of work, every block I'm looking at is the state that I'm currently going to produce work for. Does that make sense? So what you're left with here is you get this really simple binary selection uh, rule where if you look at any two blocks on the network, if you know those blocks are valid, I can just look at some header information of those blocks, a few fil fields, and very quickly, very, very cheap operation, just figure out which of the two blocks is the stronger block. And just a quick mathy thing, the selection rule forms a lattice which basically is just a fancy way of saying if I have a group of blocks, I always know that one of them is the strongest of that group, okay? There's no ambiguity. And so um, what you're left with is a situation where if I go to the network, right? Let's say I'm in light node. I'm not listening to blocks in the network. I still have to sort of, in a sense, there's this trust problem, right? How do I know they didn't just serve me a bad block? If I query N nodes in the network, as long as one of those N nodes is honest, I know what the best block is. In other words, I'm not even relying on 51% honesty for that. I just need one out of whatever my sample size is. If I ask 20 nodes in the network, 20 different validators or, you know, node operators for the best block, as long as one of them was honest about what the best block was and told me the truth, then I'll be able to know that that is actually the best block. I can verify each of the proofs of those blocks, which is proving all of this consensus information, like the density of the chain and who, whether or not each of these blocks was actually produced by somebody who was allowed to win that slot. And all that information is encapsulated in there. Once I verify those blocks, I know exactly which of the set of blocks is the strongest. Could you could you like run out what are those headers information that the best block looks at? This minimum density is is the block producer in there? Anything that you remember off the top of your head? Yeah, it's a long list. Um, also, more about it. Is there any risks that are still haven't been kind of can be still potential? No, there's no risks. Vector attacks. There's no risks. All the, all the attacks are actually mathematically proven in the Ouroboros paper to not be possible with the metrics they're looking at. It's one cool thing about Ouroboros is uh, maybe this is not still true. It has been true as of a few years ago, 
I think it's still true though. Ouroboros is the only mathematically proven proof of stake protocol. Oh, probably. So there are, there are, don't try and read the proofs. I don't recommend it. The proofs are awful to read. They're really horrible, but they have been verified by universities um, and by our own uh, PhD that we had hired in the past to, to verify the proofs as well. Um, and they've actually found some mistakes in the proofs, right. but it turns out the proofs are still valid. They just, there was just some intermediate mistakes and they could still be proven. So it's the only mathematically proven protocol. So there are no gaps. Um, in fact, the the proofs are so detailed that they're even considering parameters around network delay and attackers using network delay and taking nodes offline. There's actually a lot of detail in the proofs. It's very impressive how detailed they went. Do you mean that other uh, yellow papers or white papers are just uh, built their system like uh, they can't break it somehow? Yes. No, that, that, that's, that's, that's the truth. Okay. It's like, hey, does anybody know how to break this? They're like, I don't see a way. Um, but to, to be fair, like with BFT, you, you kind of can't mathematically prove it. It's sort of based on properties of how BFT works that you sort of buy into. Um, because this is all entirely based on probabilities, because it comes down to Nakamoto consensus, which is a probabilistic consensus mechanism, you can basically prove that there's this overwhelming probability that nobody can ever cheat it. You know, that, that's essentially what the proofs boil down to. It just becomes a really complicated version of that. They consider short fork attacks and long fork attacks as two different categories of attacks that can happen on the chain. And then they mathematically prove that those attacks cannot be executed with very specific setup of those metrics. And there's a lot of detail to them. There's like, you separate things in epochs, epochs set up VRF seeds. There's different checkpoints in which the VRF seed is computed and then has to be frozen before the next round of epochs can happen. There's like the staking ledger and there's the next staking ledger that are like two epochs apart from each other. So there's a period of time where the network has to settle and finalize what the actual staking distribution is. There's like all of these checkpoints and logical like things you have to do in Ouroboros. It's a very complicated consensus mechanism to implement. Um, but in the end, it gives you all these properties, basically. So, and we have one in a start group, which is super useful. I think I miss something, but I'm wondering just how exactly does the one of n, one honest uh, actor out of n, work? Is it simply going through the 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 heuristics for verification, like uh, like density, minimum density, or are there other factors there? So there's a binary selection rule. Basically, given any two block headers, I know which of those two block headers is uh, stronger than the other. Um, and so using that rule, I look at two blocks and I'm like, okay, this is the stronger of these two blocks. You can extend that where you have n blocks. You just sort of keep on doing that operation, folding over them all. It's like, oh, this is the best one so far. Is the next one better? Oh no, okay. Is the next one better? Oh, this one is better. And you keep on doing that. And you basically, it's a max operation. Like if I have n blocks, I can figure out what the max block is, the max strength block is in a sense from those. That's what I meant when I said a lattice before. It's like just the way of describing that com that concept that like given a set of things that have some comparison operation, I can find the max item from that list. So that answer it. And then block header is attested to by the proof. So we know that the contents of the block header, all the metrics encapsulated are correct and have been computed correctly forever via the recursion cluish. And then we're just comparing the those metrics basically. Um the, the slot times are three minutes. Right now. Right now. And and can um does that affect the performance of Mina? And yeah. can that be reduced? What what's the logic behind making it three minutes? Um, so originally when we launched mainnet, we made it three minutes because it took two and a half minutes to produce a blockchain proof. But that's not true anymore. Now you can produce a blockchain proof in about 10 seconds. So the only reason it's three minutes still with the Berkeley lot is because we didn't want to put too much risk in changing too many things about the chain for Berkeley. It's already such a large upgrade. Um, the next hard fork, we're going to dramatically reduce it. And I think in future hard forks, we're going to be dramatically reducing it too. Um, we plan to reduce it at least to 30 seconds. I think we can even do better than 30 seconds. We've tested it and had success at 20 second block times. Mm. So it doesn't make it faster. It makes finality faster. It makes transaction throughput faster. 
because we're not decreasing the number of transactions you can have in a block. We're just decreasing the time per block. And so, yeah, it does, it does heavily scale the blockchain to reduce that. The uh, reward distribution uh, time will be uh, shrinked somehow, right? Yes. And if it is still kept manually, uh, would it be a burden for um, validators to distribute the rewards? So I, I, didn't, I didn't understand. Uh, imagine that um, you make the block times like 20 seconds, then what it makes uh, each epoch one day? Um, I did the math. Less than uh, less than a month. Yeah. L less than 14 days at least. So a validator is supposed to uh, manually distribute rewards. Yeah. Uh, it, once a two day, right? Wouldn't be a burden for validators. Um, I mean, it's sort of the same burden they have now. It's just sped up. The transaction throughput is higher now, so it's the same operation, the same cost to do it, but the operation can happen faster in the network now. I will mention that one of the things we're planning to do in the future, I just don't know exactly when, is provide a, a ZK app for actually doing the, like integrate the um, validator pooling logic into a ZK app so that instead of the validators having to do these manual payouts, they'll basically collect information on chain that can be used for people to come and withdraw their claims from that ZK app. Um, that's also better for tax purposes for people too, so. Yeah, kind of wanted to ask about that because yeah, many other blockchains have their yeah. staking, the liquid staking. Mina staking still is pretty decent per se. But then I always had that feel that I as in the uh, stake uh, payouts done within the protocol somehow. Would that be ever possible, or you would look at uh, the other zk app solution like uh, what you just mentioned? Why why would it n it never been embedded within the protocol? To make those payouts. Working with that ZK app would be embedded in the protocol. Okay. So it will be embedded in the protocol. We can make it embedded in the protocol, and I think that's what we're going to require everybody to do. But um, ZK apps is just the layer that we're going to push it to because it's the layer that makes sense to have this whole concept of like on-chain, you come and interact with just a regular ZK app to do your claim. Like don't create a second like mechanism for claiming these rewards. Integrate it into the same layer that's like this programmability layer people can come and drop claims from. So. In a sense, it's like a special ZK app that's baked into the protocol in some sense, but operates on the ledger like any other ZK app. This design is still like TBD, but this is, I'm almost certain that's where we're headed. Fair enough. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about consensus for now. It's in, I can go a lot deeper in consensus, but um, I'm not going to right now because it's really boring. So, so far what we've been doing is this entire time I've just been talking about payments, right? I've just been saying, hey, we're going to send five MENA from like account A to account B and talk about how we proved that. But now let's talk about how we're integrating that into a world where people are actually writing applications on the chain. So am I going to redraw this whole thing? I'm going to redraw this whole thing. I wish I had one of those like paper things because I can go back and forth, but so, so far, we talked a lot about consensus and the state transition model and how we can take proofs from the state transition model and include them back up into the consensus layer and get that one big proof of both things. Each of these transactions we've been talking about so far are simple payments. They're following the simple circuit logic where it's like, there's a payment, I'm going to pay this person this amount of money, and that's projecting some changes into a ledger. Now we want to talk about applications where these transactions are not just payments. These transactions are actually applications that are being executed. And in a sense, what we're doing, the really simple version, it's, I mean, it's really simple, is we're just taking proofs that are off-chain and we're including them into transactions. And then the transaction proof is verifying those proofs, right? That's the whole idea. It's basically the idea that users can now generate proofs. They can submit them into the transactions. So this transaction is not just a payment anymore. This transaction is sort of anything based on what this proof is saying it should do. And then we're verifying that recursively in the state transition model. And then we're verifying that recursively in the consensus layer. And so we get this whole roll up of all the user applications forever, right? So what does that actually look like? This is the thing I always struggle to talk about a little bit, but at a very high level, if the proofs are happening off chain, right? We're not actually executing things on chain. 
we don't know what the state is that this proof will be applied to, right? We have this problem where on like EBM, the execution and the state and the sequencing, they're all together, right? When a block producer sequences a transaction, it has the state that transaction can be applied to, it executes that transaction as code and produces a new state. So the execution and sequencing are linked. In Mina, the sequencing, these two layers, is divorced from the execution. It means that when you're executing this proof here, you don't actually know the state that you're going to be applied to. Because of that, the way that we, design, that we uh, describe an application is, you know, naively, let's just say that we wanted this app to do a state transition. It's just going from some state to another state. That's not really going to work, right? Instead, what we want the app to do is we want the app to have some preconditions, things that need to be true for this app, for this, uh, this application to be processed, the update to be processed. And then if those preconditions hold, a series of updates to the chain, okay? And we break these up into bundles. Basically the way we do it, we try and draw it here, is like, you know, let's say, let's take our same example of like sending five meta from A to B, okay? But now we're gonna do it as an application, right? An application's controlling this transfer instead of just using a payment. So we're sending five MENA. The way we would encode this is, uh, I'll talk about it as, I shouldn't call stack now. I'll, I'll just say it like this. We basically have two different updates that happen. Basically two different slots of things that are happening, sort of like side effects. We have one update that's saying subtract five from here and one update that's saying add five to here. And to at least one of these updates, we need to attach a proof, okay? And so each of these updates, literally what a ZK app transaction is, it's a list of what we call account updates. They don't always have to update something. They can also just look at the account state. And so each of these can have preconditions and then updates that are down to side effects and can have those preconditions and updates committed to in the proof. These are the public input to your proof is the preconditions and updates that you're gonna do. And so the chain is able to check, you know, this proof is valid and this proof is attesting that we need to subtract five from here and we need to add five to here. And as part of that, it's saying that something has to be true about A and something has to be true about B. Now we can actually look at things about A and B and say these have to hold preconditions, but we don't have to know the exact state of B or A. I don't have to say that I know that A has five tokens to send. I can just say that A has to have greater than or equal to five tokens, right? In other words, our application's not, the public input to the application proof is not the state that we're moving from and going to the public input to the application proof is the list of constraints that can be checked on chain when it's sequenced that have to hold for this to succeed. And the chain is basically at the point it's including this in a transaction, deciding is this good or is this failed? Okay. It checks these preconditions and determines whether or not this could actually be processed. So the ZK app off chain is just attesting to the things that need to be true on chain when we sequence them, the proof for this transaction is checking that those preconditions held. I'm going to pause there, answer some questions, and then I'll move on. So anybody have questions about that? Yeah, so, well, about that, but not about that exactly. Because I've always conf been confused. Why does the read of account makes account, it within the app, it makes account update? Because it does, right? What is what? If you want to, if you are, okay. So if you are accessing another method of as other smart contract that doesn't change its state, it just reads the state, yes. it's still an account update. It is. Mm. Also, you should probably should be calling a method, but we'll talk about that later. And that's a miscommunication in the design. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but let me answer the first question in here, <laughs> which is, uh, I actually am really trying to find out a new name for this. So if people come up with a name, let me know. Account update is not an update. An account update could contain an update and that's a very confusing thing yes an account update is going to have optional preconditions and optional updates in a sense go to those are optional they're not neither is required okay the preconditions can be empty the updates can be empty that means that you can have an account update which is just verifying the state of some other account it's not changing anything account updates are not necessarily mutations it's it's sort of a a misnomer so does that answer? Verifiable query? 
it's not really a query because you could be doing something too. A query implies like immutability. What is query and mutation? What's what's a term bullet? <laughs> That's the issue. I haven't come up with a good word for it yet. Thanks. It's they're basically the way I think about them, but this is a bad name, is they're like lookup slots. Okay? Every update in the list of updates is like saying, I'm gonna look up this public key and I want to reason about it in some way. That could be me looking up that precondition there, like looking up the account and just checking a precondition. That could also be me like looking that up and uh, just doing an update without checking the precondition, but usually it's both. Usually I'm gonna look at it, like in this example, we were inspecting both, but let's say instead it wasn't this example, it wasn't A sending me, finding it to B. What if A was a token contract and B was a token holder and A is just wanting to check like if this thing is true on B, then like I'm gonna mint tokens. There, there's a precondition on A that's checking some state on A that allows B to mint tokens, but there's no update actually happening in A necessarily. Exactly my use case that I'm yeah. always confused about. So yeah, that account update. Updates be... don't need to be up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you were asking about why methods, why you don't need to call smart contract method if you need to read. So um, I'm going to talk about the call stack in a moment. And that's going to make more sense about exactly what a method call is and why it exists. But first, let me just describe how you would do it without a method call. Okay. Because a ZK app transaction is essentially a list of these, like whatever you want to call them, updates. Still keep on calling them account updates for now because it's the standard terminology. But each of these is basically a slot to look up an account in the ledger. So if we have a ledger over here, each of these can be looking at different accounts inside of this ledger and then reading the values. All of these are a read, period. Every single account update is going to read an account regardless if we're doing anything to it. In that read, we're allowed to specify preconditions, which are things that have to be true when we read the account in order for the whole thing to apply. So if I want to read the state of another account just to check if something's true about it, I don't actually need to call another method. I don't need to generate a second proof for that. The way that you usually do this is there's this concept of the call stack, which is basically, this is like a list of things. But what we do is we order them into trees. And what these trees are is these trees provide a parent child relationship such that we could have a proof here that's looking at these two updates where these two updates don't have proofs. So I could have one proof. Let's take the example where I was sending, you know, let's go back to that example I had before. That's just the easy example of A sending five mean to the B. So we're subtracting five from here and we're adding five to here. Okay. If I draw, if I fill in a circle here, that means it has a proof with. I could do this in either order, but I'm just going to do it in this order where I'm going to say this account update here is for A and says that we're going to subtract five from it. This account update for here is for B and it's going to add five to it. This proof can inspect the children account updates that it has under it. So I only need one proof that's going to check this whole operation, but you create a parent child relationship that says that this proof can look at its children. The way that you do this is actually that this whole like structure, this like we call it the call forest because it's a whole bunch of trees. But within each tree, I can basically keep on going down the tree as far as I want to look at all the account updates as private inputs to this proof and then hash them back up to get the root of that tree. And that's what my child actually is. The, the child is the root of my call stack. It's just a Merkle commitment to the account updates that are underneath me. So if I have one proof, that wants to read another account, I don't need to call another method in a smart contract and generate a second proof for that. I can just literally look at that account in a child account update and then put a precondition in there or something. In other words, let's go back to the example where we're minting a token. Let's say that you could do it this way. I mean, this probably isn't the way you do it, but I just want to kind of hammer in the idea. You probably do it the opposite way. Let's say that I am the token holder and I want to mint tokens. And so for me to mint tokens, I need to prove that 
the token contract allows me to mint tokens. And maybe this is as simple as just checking some state field on here, okay? I don't need to call a method into the token contract to do this. All I have to do is just push an update that has a precondition on the token contract that's checking the state. And then I'm able to mint up here, but I could generate the proof from the holder. Usually you probably reverse this. Usually you want to have the token contract have all the contract codes. So you probably actually do this in the opposite order. But the point I'm trying to drill in here is that when I want to look at multiple accounts in the ledger, I don't have to generate proof for all those. I don't have to have them all be contracts. I don't even have to know about the contract code. I just have to know about what kind of precondition I need to make on the other account in the ledger. And then I can push that into my call stack and inspect it for my proof. Um, down to like Soldify, if I have a ZK app with states uh, and my methods, uh, that doesn't have uh, any get assertions, but only do set and maybe like, you know, uh, assert bigger than, I don't know, uh, then that wouldn't cause any concurrency issue, you say? If you're only setting it and not reading states, there's no concurrency issue because you're just overriding all your states. I mean, you are creating a concurrency issue in a sense because you don't know what the ordering is going to be and you don't know if the transitions are valid. Uh, and that can be changed uh, till the hard finality, right? The final state. I don't quite understand. If the operations are not uh, competitive, um, then uh, till the hard finality, uh, the order that they're executed can be changed. Yes. Um, so basically there's a difference between writing like get and require equals a state and then assert something and directly asserting while, you know, at the beginning without actually getting anything. Yes. If you don't do the require equals, you're not making a precondition. Um, and would it be possible theoretically, um, to write a code, um, that executes something, uh, conditionally, uh, without knowing the condition, like, can I say if A has bigger than five pounds, transfer all of them to B. I don't know the state, but I need to know the state to execute the transaction. Can I write? That is what preconditions are for. Now, you can't, what you can't do right now easily is have an else clause. Like if that's not true, then do this. But if you want to predicate some update happening, that's exactly what preconditions are for. Preconditions are saying this thing has to be true for this update to happen. The update won't happen if the preconditions don't match. Uh, but can I make the update like depend on the current state without knowing the state? Yes, that's what preconditions are. Preconditions are not a commitment to the state. They're a commitment to a, uh, a condition on the state. Now, you're limited in what you can do. You can only do equals, greater than, greater than equals, less than, or less than and equals. Those are the, the five operations that you get in your preconditions. So depending on how your state's represented, you might be exactly in that situation. Like if you have a Merkle tree that's committed to in a state field, you're basically stuck reasoning about that exact state. Okay. Um... But like, can I set something, like, can I say, I don't want to get the state of B. I don't want to like know the exact state. I just want to check, you know, it's bigger than this. Yes. And I, then I want to um, set a state to B state. Yes. Can I write this code right now? You can write that code right now. How do I? Uh, don't do get and require equals. Just do require equals. Ah, don't get. Or you do require greater than. You don't get it. The get and require equals pattern is saying the state say has to equal the thing I just read from the chain. It's a bad pattern for a lot of applications. And we'll talk later about like the redesign of the DSL I want to do. So it's going to make this a lot clearer. But right now, because the class abstractor is obscuring a lot of this, it's not obvious that that's not what you would have to do. It's it's hiding the preconditions from you. So you don't see what's going on with preconditions. So what's the deal with the limit of account updates per single call? There is seven to nine, something like that, right? Yes. That has to do with a couple of factors. The biggest one is transaction size. The more account updates you allow, the larger the transaction size is. The other one is the way that we're doing it in the scan state. Sorry, that, that big Q structure is the scan state. The account updates are not embedded into there. I'm going to try and explain this without redrawing it because I want to redraw the whole thing. I don't remember. But, but basically, um, in the future, you'll be able to prove those account updates in parallel. Right now, within that one work item for that transaction, you have to prove all the account updates. So if you allowed an unbounded number of account updates, not only could the transactions become way too large or the chain, you know, it would hurt the chain. But in addition to that, it would also create a bottleneck in the prover queue because you have to prove all those account updates before you can continue to the next transaction in the queue. Does that help? It's... 
Yeah, it's, yeah, it's um, something to fix in the future. We still have the blocker because you can just kind of do any method and top one. Just yeah, there's things you can do. Experience. It, it, it just makes it annoying, right? Yeah. Um, so it's something to fix in the future. I think, I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where you have an unbounded number of account updates because of the transaction size issue. You don't want to have an unlimited transaction size. That's really bad. You could take down nodes by setting gigantic transactions. But I do think that we can heavily increase it. Doesn't need to be eight. That's like a, a now that Um, real quick, I'm just going to wrap up by explaining what a method call is. Whenever you're calling a method, you're generating a proof for that next step. So if this was a method call, you're generating a proof for the token. Not only is this more expensive for you to do computationally, it's also going to make your transaction cost more money. Every proof is going to change the weight of your transaction. We have this concept because we don't have gas. We have this really cool thing we can do where we can look at this account list of account updates and know exactly how much work it costs the network. In other words, we actually weigh the transactions by the amount of work they're going to incur. And then what we're actually looking at in the mempool is the fee divided by the weight. So because we don't have gas, it's really cool that we can do this. And it's a cool feature of the chain. But it also means that the more proofs you're stuffing into an individual transaction, the more fee you're going to have to pay in order for your proof to be competitive. Because somebody who pays the same amount of money for a transaction with two proofs, but only has a transaction with one proof, their transaction is cheaper than your transaction. Does that make sense? Because the weight of your transaction was heavier. But then you have recursion, right? You can just recursively prove your own. Yes, you can. That's, but if you do the method calls, you're not doing recursion. Cannot I write a separate method that proves those two methods? You would have to do it as a ZK program. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Method calls in the smart contract layer right now are all separate account updates that have proofs attached to them. And so in the example I was given before, you know, like I said, you probably have token up here and holder down here. Usually it's a more sensible way to do it. But the, if like I was doing this, if I had to do something in the holder where I had to check a predicate of the holder from the token owner, then I don't actually, A, want to know the token, the, the, like, the token holder's contract and have to execute that code. And B, I don't want to pay for the proof. It costs me more time. It costs me more money. Like it's not necessary. The, each of these like account updates is a slot for me to look at things on the, on the chain. I don't need a method on a smart contract to read state from the chain. Methods on smart contracts are for generating proofs. Is every uh, method compiled or um, to create a proof, their compilation of two circuits or constraints uh, are used? I mean, is every method is compiled in some uh, step to circuits? Yes. Okay. Yeah, every every method is its own zero knowledge circuit. Mm -hmm. What a ZK program is or a smart contract is, is it's a recursive layer on top of all the methods. So every method is its own zero knowledge proof. And then we tie that together with a layer of recursion so that you can basically fold them all into one verification key at the end. That's what's actually going on. The proof that you attach is actually the recursive proof verifying whatever method you did. That, that's sort of like, it uses this, this thing called a side mode and verification key to do that. So rather than saying, this is the verification key I'm going to verify, the verification key becomes an input to the start proof. And then that allows you to say, it has to be one of these verification keys, you know. I have a smart contract with one single method. Do you still have to recursively create verification key? Yes, outfit? you do. But it's uh, it, you don't think about it that it, that hard. It's not terribly expensive to. But this is the way that pickles and kimchi works. Um, actually, it, for reasons because there's like two different curves that you're operating on. Even the blockchain proof is proven and then recursively proven again. It's an implementation detail of recursion. You have a pairing of like two different curves. Anyway, I, I'm not an expert of it. I can't talk about that much. I, Don't ask me. There's a, there's a lot of back and forth between two different proof systems in a sense all the time. 
one for recursion, one for logic, I sort see. of. That's part of how we do it efficiently. Whereas other chains have other proof systems have a harder time if they don't design it this way. But yeah, you should ask other people who know cryptography. Okay. So now I'm going to talk some about actions reducers, what they are, why you would use them. So, so far, all the stuff we've been talking about, this is basically how the L1 CK apps work. Okay. This is compared to Ethereum because you're always doing the proving and the user space separately from the sequencing layer. It's basically a highly concurrent computer. And being a highly con concurrent computer, you run into all the issues that highly concurrent computers have regarding race conditions, right? You experience race conditions at the L1 layer. Because what we've done is we've explicitly removed sequencing and execution from each other. We divorced the two. Actions and reducers are the pattern to basically put sequencing back into the execution. That's the way you can think about it. So the idea is that you have this distributed, that you have this decentralized consensus mechanism that does sequencing. And you have this off-chain execution system that can do execution. Actions are the way to allow the L1 to sequence what needs to happen while off-chain work can happen to execute the sequence that was agreed to. In other words, you're using actions to bootstrap off of consensus. Does that make sense? Consensus is the system through which the network achieves, you know, well, consensus on what the sequence should be. And then you're using that agreed upon sequence you uh, have submitted to then execute the order the network has agreed to. And so the way that that works literally is you can just think about actions like a queue. Every account is storing a Merkle commitment to the head of the queue. This is just a Merkle list. Okay. And when users go and they submit actions to the queue, these get ordered into the queue by the network. So when users come and they submit actions, they're just submitting transactions and saying, I want to push to the end of this queue. But maybe the network defines this order based on the order you received it in, or maybe, you know, these two get swapped because of the order the node is in, or it has to do with the transaction fees. I basically don't know what the sequence is going to be until the network has run for a bit and come to consensus on this. At the point that the sequence is committed to, a reducer, which is just a ZK, uh, you know, basically a recursive proof for a ZK app, can go through and it can roll the execution of all of these things up and bring it back to the head of the action queue. Okay. And that's really all actions reducers is. It's just a concept of like using a Merkle list on chain to define a sequence that you want to execute things in. What was yeah, that? It's not a counter pattern that it been added to make it life easier. It's a proper pattern that should be used. Yeah. It is a proper pattern that should be used, but today it's a little too hard to use properly. So we'll talk about what's wrong with this pattern today and what makes it really hard to use correctly and the mistakes that most people are making. Um, I think of the teams I've seen build ZK apps, and I haven't read everybody's ZK apps, the only team that's figured out how to actually use this correctly is ProtoCut. Interesting. Uh, my whole ZK app depends on it, so yeah. as you can take a look later. I'll give you some pseudocode later too if that fixes it. Um, okay, so implementation detail. If we were to off-chain reduce everything in this list and commit back to this uh, this Merkle, this head of the list right here for the action queue, well, by the time we actually submit it to the chain, what if like new actions have been submitted? Wow, what a bad square. Well, now the thing I committed to is not actually my account state anymore. I'm making a precondition on the fact that I've connected back to the head of the action queue, but the action queue has moved since then. In other words, the action queue has the same kind of race condition issue that anything in the network has. The way the network gets around this is the network actually stores five positions from here, which are basically what the state of the action queue was at the end of the last five blocks. And so what this means is like, you know, if F, was the head of the action queue, you know, and the queue moves, well, as long as I get to submit within five blocks, then it's still good. The problem with this is that it's only the last five blocks, right? And I'm only allowed to look at the last five blocks. So imagine now I try to do this operation, but it was too slow or my server went offline for a bit. 
And now I've lost all of these. I'm way far in the future. And none of the last five blocks have this anymore. So now I have to redo this operation and I have to catch up. That might be fine. I can maybe keep on doing this. I have more and more things recursively proved and eventually I will connect it back to the head of the queue. But there's an interplay here. Side effects. As we mentioned before, there's a hard limit on eight account updates per ZK app transaction, right? That hard limit means, imagine like I was just doing something really simple, like an airdrop. Okay, this is just the simplest example. So each of these was a flame and an airdrop. And I have a Merkle tree of nullifiers. That's how I check double spends that I can only withdraw once. I'm going to use actions reducers because every user trying to interact with that tree is going to have a race condition. So then I'll use these. But every time I reduce an action, I have to push an account update to send them tokens. If I have more than seven actions here to process in one transaction, I can't fit them all on a single transaction anymore. And so if the queue has moved so far ahead, there's more than seven things I actually do here, my, my ZK app is just deadlocked. There's no way I can ever reach back up to that queue because I've hit a different limit related to the side effects I was doing here. And if I relax those side effects saying, oh, I'm just going to skip them, well, then I've created, I've ruined censorship resistance because now my application can arbitrarily just censor people's attempts to withdraw airdrops, which is the whole point of this action queue is we're trying to get censorship resistance through the L1, right? And so in some cases where there's no side effects, this might be fine. But most applications have side effects. Most applications are sending people money. They're looking at different things on the chain. They're looking at other states of accounts. They have interactions that have to go with processing this individual action. And because of that eight account update limit, it means that I'll basically deadlock if I ever get to the point where I'm overflowing that eight account update limit within the number of actions I have to reduce. And I can't reduce the actions up to some partial point. I have to reduce it up into what the action queue was at some point in the last five blocks. Even assuming my app was online all the time, if I got more than seven transactions that su submitted actions in a single block, I'm still screwed. Two things here. Uh, we, uh, if I remember correctly, you still can only query the actions from particular action hash. So you can get a subset of actions in the past. But you can't prove that it was actually related to the action queue you have on chain. Let's see. I guess. There is this trick you can do where, let's say I wanted to process three transactions and now the queue is like up here. Well, I could produce a Merkle proof saying, oh, this was existentially in that chain, right? But the problem is that proof is O of N. And if I'm doing that proof N times, it's, sorry for writing sideways, O of N squared. That sucks. I don't want to do O of N squared operations. But if I, if I always start the last processed action hash within my ZK app, I could always go back to it and not which is exactly what you have to do. But now imagine I can only process three actions. So I'm going to move it to here. But I don't know without proving this connection that this was actually part of the queue. My application could just arbitrarily choose any sequence of actions. It's not connected to the queue. I have to prove it's somehow connected to one of the queue points that was committed to in the last five blocks. And that's where the O of N squared thing comes in. You can do that, but realistically you can't. All of N squared proofs is crazy. There is a solution to this. You can solve this, but it's not an out of the box solution and it's not provided by O1JS. Okay. So let's say I want to choose an arbitrary number of actions from the queue and efficiently reduce just a set of actions I choose. Like I want to say, I'm going to reduce three actions from the queue. Okay. Here's how you can do that. And I can provide some pseudocode for this later. And this is exactly what Protokit does too, by the way. What I can do is, this is the head of my queue right now. And that queue is going to keep on building here. But what I can do is, I know that this is the last point I processed to. And I know that this is a point that I want to process until. I can take a snapshot of that. What I do is I actually snapshot all this information. So I just have that portion of the queue right here. Let me get these names. Okay, but now I'm back in the O of N squared problem still, because if I want to pull just one action off here, then I have to do N minus one recursive proofs to prove it's here. And then I pull the next option off, I do N minus two recursive proofs and N squared, right? 
So there's this other trick that you can do where you then take the snapshot and you produce a Merkle proof of the reversal of this list, okay? Merkle lists are just link lists. As you know, an index operation and a link list is O of n. And so if you do in loops of O of n link list indexes, that's O of n squared. But now that I've reversed it, popping off the head of the queue is O of y. And so I can say, I'm going to do A, I'm going to move the pointer. And I'm going to do B, and move the pointer. And it's O of 1 now. And this just becomes an O of n operation instead of O of n squared. And so the trick is to take snapshots to reverse them so I have a stack that I can pop off of, to pop off that stack and in increments that I can handle until eventually this is empty and then I take another snapshot. But if you don't build your contract like this, your contract is susceptible to deadlocks that you can't control. Users can make your contract deadlock. I see. Uh, we mentioned this is not possible to make snapshot in ONJS, right? No, it's possible to. It's not provided by the action reducer toolkit in ONJS. I see, because I know you that can't, you can't use the, the action reducer pattern that exists in ONJS, like the, you know, it's like the reducer you can include in your contract. You can't implement it with that. Um, so maybe we're going to talk about that, but can we talk about the storage aspect of this? Like, what's the best way of storing those without actually decreasing decentralization and like, I don't know, decreasing liveness? Well, actions are uh, stored inside of the archive, though. Yeah, but do you think like that's the best solution possible because in that there are no incentive mechanisms for archive nodes and like saying that the applications that need actions and users should run their own archive nodes and I don't know like is this a fair model? I mean the incentive is that explorers have to run archive nodes and provide the data um, but you know I there are ways you can integrate with other data availability platforms like Celestia and things like that that is totally possible and we are talking with Celestia about that but honestly, I'm personally not totally convinced it's that necessary. I think the incentives to run archive nodes and provide the data are already there. There are app developers that need to run them. There are explorers that need to run them. And explorers have business models from running them. So like, I, I'm not as worried about the data availability problem of uh, actions because there is data availability provided through the blockchain history. And there are so many incentives to run the blockchain history. It's only in a world where everybody stops running archive nodes and decides that they're going to paywall the databases to actually like access this information that is actually an issue. And we are still looking at the data availability solutions that are more like robust, but I I'm personally not that worried about it. I don't know. You can tell me if you're worried about it, but I think it's actually not that important. It's sort of like a, you're basically saying like, you know, you only need one person to provide you the data, right? You're not trusting an entire network of people and you're not actually trusting them at all because it's Merkleized data that's been committed to on chain. They can't lie about the information they give you. They can only refuse to give you the information. So it's the world in which everybody has decided they're not going to provide archive node data that you would live in that you couldn't do this. That's my opinion. But yeah, uh, there there will be integrations with other data, data availability providers. I'll get on this. I'm going to talk about side effects now some more because there's another issue with side effects that you'll also have to think about with your contract. So going back to the situation where you want to do an airdrop, let's ignore actions reducers. Let's say you're fine with the race conditions. That's not the issue. Let's just say that you have, you know, some contract that wants to send, it, can, it doesn't have to be a token. It can just be five mina. Okay. It's back to that same five mina problem. There's an issue with this. Well, actually, I will, I will talk about the context of action reducers because the more, well, we'll just talk about it like that, right? You have some sequence that's been committed to. You have to process this. A has to do this thing. Otherwise, A can't do anything else that's been in queue. Okay? So A is stuck doing this thing. They're committed to doing this thing. They have to gear it. Okay? Otherwise, their application can't continue. Right? Whether it's through actions reducers or through other application logic, this is like the next step in the computation is they have to do this stuff. Right? There's an issue that imagine B is a user account and A is the smart contract account. Okay? What if B sets the receive permission to none and then asks you for five mina? And now you have to send them five mina, but you can't because their permissions have actually disallowed you from doing that. 
like you basically say B sets because we have all those permissions that you can set. B sets receive equals impossible. Or even if B sets receive to signature, right? It's like, oh, you have to have my private key to do this, you know? Like both those situations, if you're A, you're just like, well, I have to do this thing. You've told me I have to do it. I've allowed you to let me do it. And now I can't process it. Well, naively, maybe one way to solve it is like, in order for B to submit the action, B has to prove that its permissions are valid, but B can just change its permissions afterwards. They're concurrent. Nothing stopped B from changing its permissions if I'm just setting up a regular Nina account. B can come in and do this and now deadlock my contract arbitrarily. And so this becomes an issue, a design issue with the chain. And I have a few different solutions for this, actually, that I'm hoping to, maybe I'll workshop it later. One of them is ZK Promise. We'll talk about that later. But um, the... The issue here is that like, if I just naively design my smart contract to allow people to come in and request withdrawals, and then I am you know, committed to the fact I'm going to do that withdrawal, they could deadlock my contract, and it's outside my control. And so in your smart contract design, you have to carefully design around this today. This is not a problem with other chains. It's something that we have to think about when we're actually designing our smart contract. There's a few ways to do it. One way is to have permissioned accounts. This is what Protokit does, okay? What Protokit does is Protokit says, you can't come and ask for a withdrawal from any account. You have to come and ask for a withdrawal from an account that I made for you, or you could ask me to make for you. And what that does is there's this whole token uh, parent-child relationship, but if you remember the call stack, when you have a token parent-child relationship, anytime I do an account update on a child, I have to generate a proof from the parent to make that account update. In other words, I can't just update the child directly. I have to go through the smart contract logic. And so this makes it so that you can ensure they don't send the permissions in a way that you can't handle. That's one way of solving it. But it requires you to keep on allocating accounts in the ledger, right? Now I don't just pay one MENA account creation fee for my account. I have to create one MENA account creation fee for every protocol app chain I interact with. They're all separate. They're all different settlement contracts. They're all going to require additional accounts for interaction. And I'm going to have to keep on paying that per application I interact with. And that's money down the drain that I don't want to spend. It's a bad user experience. I have to know that I have this account and reuse it. Now I'm controlling a bunch of different private keys. I'm not just controlling one private key. It's a big pain in the ass. Actually, you, don't, you can get around the private key issue, but that's, not, that's beside the point. So that's one way of doing it, is with this parent-child relationship called permission accounts. The other way of doing it is by always making a new account. In other words, if B asks me for money, A doesn't actually send money to B. A sends money to some new contract, C that's deployed, and B has permission to take that money out of C. Okay, if B comes along with its private key and generates a proof against account C saying, I own the private key for B, then B can transfer the money out wherever, right? Well, this is also annoying. This is actually even worse because permission accounts were at least reusable, even though they're paying. This one, I th the, the contract owner has to keep on paying for it. Maybe they can charge the user who submitted the action, but it's one MENA per interaction now, not just one MENA per space that I can do interactions in, right? And so both of these solutions are not great. Um, what I'm working on implementing right now in the protocol with the protocol team is this idea of deletable accounts and then this pattern called consumable accounts, which are accounts that you allocate that have to be deleted and you get a refund when you delete it. And that is used to then build ZK Promise, which is like a concurrency abstraction for sequencing updates that need to happen afterwards. And so the idea is that basically you could do the same pattern here. This doesn't exist right now, but I hope with state, it's currently slated for the next hard fork. We'll see if it makes it or not, but I think it will. Um, Next hard fork should be in about six months, by the way, for people's context. Um, will not be as painful as Berkeley. And so the idea is that you can do the same pattern, but when B pulls the money from C, it has to delete C, has no option. And that refund would go back to A, or maybe you go back to B, depending on how you program it. You can program where the refund goes for the account creation fee. In addition, maybe what you could do instead is like, if I put this five MENA here and B never withdraws it, I could have an expiration in slots where A can come back in and, and take the money back. Like, you know, you can basically write this as programmable logic for C that's like, okay, you know, either let B withdraw it, or if it's been like 100 slots and they still haven't withdrawn it, then anybody can come in and refund it back to me, right? So you create this whole system of logic for like, 
refunding the fee, who you're sending the fee to. Maybe the way this actually works is that B, when it submits the action to A, is going to give the one MENA. And then we're going to give one plus five MENA here. And then we get one plus five MENA back out. So it's like basically the cycle of how we're transferring the money that was used as a bond for allocating the account. And so this is what I want to work towards now on the protocol. And that's the pattern I think is going to make the most sense for the immediate future. Even past that, I think there are other ways to solve this problem, but this problem just kind of comes naturally from how, actually from how mission model is. And I would argue this is not a bad thing that our permission model is this flexible. It's actually really the power of the protocol that you can do this, but it introduces a new set of problems. On EBM, you could implement the same kind of system without having the issue because on EBM, you can do try catch. It's like, I'm going to try to send the money. Oh, I couldn't. I'm going to handle the error and skip it. You know what I mean? Like that can be codified in the logic of the contract. But Amina, you sort of only go forward. It's like linear. You can only move forward, right? There are other things you could do, like looking back, the transaction failed. You could try and prove that you tried a transaction and you couldn't process it. But those are really painful. They hurt throughput of your smart contract because you have to try something and then prove that it failed later. Th this is the way forward to actually like let the contract just move forward. Because the whole point is the contract wants to do something and then the contract wants to unblock the rest of the actions that are in the sequence. Um, just to clarify, this exists in all cross-application state updates, right? Yes. Yeah, ba basically every single one, because there's also this really nasty permission called access. It's used for um, token parent-child relationships. But what this access permission does is basically mean you can't even put an account update against that at all. All account updates that attempt to look at this account will fail. So it does exist for any interaction, even if you're just doing a precondition. Uh, with these sets of problems and then the attention moving to how to kind of do the workarounds with with like ephemeral or refundable accounts. Mm -hmm. Um was there what was yeah, was it was there some thinking around the permission model that would handle this scenario um up front? Or like when did this sort of arrive and was there an exploration that didn't involve the workaround basically? I'm interested to understand that. So I thought about it so I had conversations with Matthew about it. The problem is this permission model is really powerful and really important. Anything you do to weaken this might solve some use cases for this problem, but not all. You're just sort of like shaving off some problem areas at the cost of like weakening the, per the permission model. And the permission model is actually really powerful. It's actually a good thing. Some things could be weakened from it. You could argue that some things are not necessary. Maybe this access permission can be modeled a different way. But even if you fix this access permission, you still have these other permission issues. And even if you fix these permission issues, you still have the issue with the subproofs. If I can't generate a subproof, I can't send the transaction at all. And so no matter what you do to the permission model, the permission model is an example of what can go wrong with this. But the problem is bigger than the permission model. So even if you deleted the whole permission model, you still have this problem. You still have a subproof problem. Exactly. And so I basically decided that messing with the permission model is not the solution here. The solution here is an architectural day. It's... And I think there's other ways to solve it than this. This is like a very straightforward path forward. It can be wrapped up in a pretty nice way in O1JS that people don't have to think about that much, like the ZK promise idea. But um, long term, I think there are other ways that we can think about fixing this. There's like certain limited forms of on-chain execution can help with this. Having like try-catch logic that's available and accessible and account updates is a way to deal with this. But, you know, all of those still have sort of some issues regarding like executing some proofs. So the only one that completely removes the subproof issue is the ephemeral account ones. Because in the ephemeral account, the subproof execution happens by C, by another party that has to come in and finish the computation. Or it could happen by A, but like the point is that you separate it out of the, the state machine for the reducer, so you don't deadlock the contract if there's an issue processing the side effect. 